Uh, we will start now into our second panel discussion uh, on the changing financial and business model for media in the 21st century. Uh, as we move into the second discussion, I would like to review the ground rules very briefly. Uh, panelists, each of you will be uh, given 10 minutes to make your statements. Uh, I will be strictly enforcing this time, to the extent I can, uh, to leave as much time as possible for the public comment period. And members of the audience, please uh, listen respectfully to the panelists, even if you disagree with something that may be said. Uh, there will be an opportunity for public comment and questions uh, at the close of the presentations. Uh, and I want to mention, for the benefit of those who, are, who may be watching uh, this on a stream, that uh, anyone can send in a question by Twitter at the hashtag M-O-W-K-S-P. And we did get one uh, tweeted question earlier, so uh, we're, we welcome those. Participating in this panel uh, will be Tiffany Yang Chen, Cheng, the co-founder of Participatory Culture Foundation, Jamie Daves, venture partner, City Light Capital, and executive director, Think Social, the Paley Center for Media, Brian Grief, president and general manager, KRON-TV, and vice president of news, Young Broadcasting, James Hamilton, Professor, Sanford School of Public Policy, Duke University. Jim Joyce, President, National Association of Broadcast Employees and Technicians, and Vice President, Communications Workers of America. And Alan Mutter, Publisher, Reflections of a Newsasaur. I'm very sad to announce that a final panelist, Dr. Larry Darby, uh, died unexpectedly of a heart attack this week actually after having submitted his statement for this hearing. Um, his passing is a terrible blow not only to his family but to all of his friends and colleagues in Washington. He was very much a member of the FCC family, having served as a bureau chief and as chief economist for the commission. Uh, we're very saddened by his passing, and I would just ask those present to have a moment of silence. Thank you. Larry's statement will be included in the record of our proceeding. We'll begin with Ms. Cheng. Thanks. My name is Tiffany Cheng, and I am a co-founder and former executive director of the Participatory Culture Foundation. Um, I have something prepared on media consolidation and new media. Um, as a practitioner of new media, I think that's the reason why I'm here to speak um, consolidation has taken its toll on media and discourse. Although the Internet presents a new, open opportunity to redefine the role of independent media in mainstream culture, the same consolidating forces are creeping into the space. In addition, the relationship between Internet-based content and less consumer-expensive media outlets such as TV and radio has been untenable from the very beginning, and it seems it will keep on this path because of the consolidation of media resources and a few big players. We can't pretend that because the format of media changes ad infinitum, the largest and most powerful players will not distort the new forms. It is the case that they do. Every new media system, any new, me any new system, must ensure that tools and resources are in the places and within the reach of the majority of individuals rather than a few. The form and distribution of media will always change. Newsrooms will change and so far in many ways it has changed. There's much to work out, but the fact that media consolidation continues as people are losing jobs in journalism is keeping new models for journalism for a greater number at bay and is impeding progress. Although there's an opportunity for 21st century media to make the most of a public hunger to get more involved in producing high-quality journalism, our laws must understand and account for findings from competition studies in media and in reference to big businesses and economies of scale. It's who government protects and who it doesn't protect that is the question. I do mean who. Media consolidation and profit making has helped to push profit to upper management. We should ask, what are the levers of media distribution and creation? What we come up with are the levers that are the responsibility of our polity to democratize and protect for everyone. 
Although the internet seems infinite, it's in many ways not. People can only see so many web pages in a day or get recommended web pages per day. Top 20 sites are owned by big business because they're so big they can dominate in every field by putting down more dollars and pass more policies. There are levers we need to think about that allows those in positions of extreme consolidation of power to continu continue growing beyond the capacity of smaller journalistic and media activities. What are the levers that the more pow powerful have um, greater access to, putting them at a further advantage? As a democracy, we care about thought, diverse opinion, and discourse and participation. We, should, we also should care more about competition and individual freedom to exercise rights. Media consolidation does keep that from happening. Um, and, uh, you know, Comcast, the largest cable and internet provider, is proposing a takeover NBC, the largest movie and TV studios. That is a no-go. That's an incredible amount of power and too much power for one company. We need new legal definitions for anti-competitive power and dominance in media. Public broadcasting and independent media depend on technologies that are nonprofit and have the interests of independent media in mind. That's why we make Miro. Um, which I'll, I'll show in a second. The internet presented this unprecedented opportunity to democratize the resources and distribution channels of media. Miro, as a nonprofit in the public's interest, is helping to build equal access and a system based on merit. It is public media infrastructure, and we hope we will grow to the usage levels that will truly turn what we have now into the democratized media infrastructure that we really need. Um, our laws and the governance of those laws have a role to play to make sure infrastructure like Miro or our bandwidth is democratic. In addition, when discourse through media is increasingly based on market research by big companies rather than coming directly from these local and national sources, there's a loss in the greater scheme of things of a more accurate and more relevant narrative of the things that make discourse richer. Language and thought gets more distant, more out of touch, and more dumbed down. Consolidated media, media is inappropriate media for our times. Uh, beyond a certain point, it seems clear that media has no economies of scale. Cross-ownership has shown to result in a net loss of local content. CNBC is trying to consolidate local sports program under their own arm. It's obvious, in this case, what will be lost. Our laws should ensure that competition exists and no disproportionately large, too big to compete against media giant exists. By allowing for greater media consolidation, one is hope holding back the channels and avenues for greater diversity and deeper thought to reach viewers. Competition principles cannot be ignored. What role is there for the FCC? The internet has brought on various new schemes to allow for the utilization of decentralized independent efforts, not for a disproportionate big media profit, but for creating a more vibrant society and discourse where people want more media because they think more and participate more. We just need to make sure we have the chance to do just that. The FCC's role, role should be to make sure that can happen in, the, in this new media system of TV, radio, paper, and internet. We, I'm just going to quickly go over our general four arguments for open video. We do mostly deal with open video. Um, next slide, please. Um, so you, you can see what we make. It's at getmiro.com. Um, and it's a decentralized video player that allows you to download video from all over the internet and play it back. Um, next slide, please. We also make something that allows you to turn any video format into an open format so that it's more easily shareable across the internet. Next slide, please. Um, and we make something that helps local broadcast stations and local communities build a web presence and build an online um, uh, video community called Miro Community. We actually are working with, next slide please, we actually are working with Duke University and they're one of our first pilot projects um, and this is their site so far. Next slide please. Um, we also do movement building. We, ca we have uh, created the Open Video Alliance with many uh, for-profit and non-profit organizations interested in promoting open video. Next slide please. We're, adding, we're helping to add video to Wikipedia. Um, we're also helping to build the tools that we need to allow translations to happen wherever video exists and to propagate wherever video propagates. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This is what the interface looks like. Next slide. 
Video is the most influential medium and the most closed online medium at, the, at this point. Um, you can look at things like YouTube and uh, Flash content. Next slide. Here are four arguments, and I'll go through it quickly. There's the freedom case. It's probably where a lot of us start in this room. There's uh, obviously lots of freedom on the internet. Um, and, and the type of content is, has exploded, and it's beyond the limitations of what Hollywood and mainstream television has given us so far. Next slide, please. And then there's the business case. AOL is a perfect example. Um, eventually, it became too closed. The internet, in general, was open. It was bad for AOL, but it was good for things like eBay. Next slide, please. Open does build markets. Getting rid of proprietary codecs is bad for patent holders. Eliminating gatekeepers is bad for the TV networks. Maybe bad for the movie studios. Eliminating centralization would be bad for YouTube. The public value case, I think, um, this is often touched upon, um, and, and there's just extreme public value in sharing so much content. Next slide, please. Oh, the governance case. We can decide what shape the world takes, how our communication space looks and works, and that's the important piece, is who is going to govern open online video. Um, and we can leave that shaping to uh, a few players, or we can make the most of what the internet has already offered and model it after um, what, what is already shown to be powerful on the internet. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Cheng. <clears throat> we understand that Mr. Daves is in transit, so we'll hear next from Mr. Grief. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Brian Greif. Um, I work for Young Broadcasting Incorporated. We own 10 television stations across the United States. We uh, range as far east as Richmond, Virginia, as far west as San Francisco. I have two jobs with the company. <clears throat> I am currently the general manager of Cron Television, an independent station here in, in the San Francisco area. And I also serve as the vice president of news for the company. And in that role, I oversee news strategy for all 10 television stations. And it's at this point that I have to make a confession my first job in news was Weekend Anchor, and they fired me after three newscasts because I couldn't read the prompter. So I'll, I'll try and get through this as best I can. <clears throat> Our company believes strongly in the importance of localism and diversity. At Cron, we produce 10 and a half hours of news daily, Monday through Friday. That amounts to more than 52 hours of local news a week. In addition, we regularly produce local specials. This month alone, we are producing five primetime political specials on the races for governor and the Senate seat here in California. Our Nashville, Tennessee station, WKRN, recently produced 50 hours of commercial-free, continuous coverage during the floods. That allowed us to provide badly needed emergency information to the public in the Nashville and central Tennessee area. In addition, WKRN in Nashville produced and broadcast during the first week of the floods a three-night telethon that raised over $600,000 for flood relief. Our station in Knoxville, Tennessee, has a special dedication to consumer and investigative reporting. WATE was the first media outlet in the country to expose problems with sticking accelerators in some Toyota vehicles. This year alone, young broadcasting stations have received six regional Murrow Awards for coverage of important breaking news events, investigative reporting, and other community events. We now face a number of new opportunities and new uncertainties. <clears throat> new technology expands the opportunities for local broadcasters, but it also slices the pie thinner, and in a difficult economy, the risks are greater. In the San Francisco market, for example, there are dozens of places that people can go for local news and information. There are six stations that provide a traditional newscast Monday through Friday in the Bay Area. In addition, there are a number of daily and weekly newspapers and far too many, too many uh, internet options to count. At the same time, total spending for advertising in the San Francisco market has dropped steadily. 
In 2004, the total market, including, including political spending, was $622 million. This year, the total market, including political, is projected at $438 million. I would reinforce the point that local television is not ancient technology. We work to offer content information across a number of new media platforms. We are constantly looking for new opportunities through new technology to deliver information. We agree with the Commission that localism and diversity is an important value. To ensure that citizens have access to important local news and information, broadcasters could use the FCC's help in several areas. <clears throat> the first area is protect the future of the broadcast spe spectrum. The value of our digital spectrum is untapped. The best use of that space is still unknown as the technology advances. We are constantly looking for opportunities for that space for additional programming and information. Some broadcasters are multicasting. While that does offer opportunities for expanded news and local information, multicasting is in its infancy. Recognize the, recognizing the fu future potential and value of that space to broadcasters is important. <clears throat> the Commission needs to help protect our interests in the future of the digital spectrum as we evaluate opportunities with the rapidly involving spectrum. We are at a crossroads right now regarding the digital spectrum. It is not clear which road is the right one for local broadcasters. <clears throat> we need protection, flexibility, and freedom to look at all options before, before picking a direction. Content sharing. More open content sharing between media partners is another opportunity for broadcasters. Allowing media interests in a market to share commodity content would result in greater efficiencies for all broadcasters. In addition, it frees crews to do more in-depth work to better serve the interests of the community. We are currently limited by the FCC to sharing no more than 15% content. A more open approach to sharing content will lead to greater content and more in-depth content for the public. Ownership rules. Because of the fragmentation of media, and the economic conditions, it is important that different media outlets be able to work together. This provides greater efficiencies and flexibilities. Allowing two, op two television stations to operate together in a market or a television station newspaper combination would allow more viable media outlets in an individual market and provide more choice, not less choice. Without more open cross-ownership or greater content sharing, we believe the public will see fewer local sources for news and information. Thank you. Thank you much, very much, Mr. Greif. Uh, we'll hear next from Professor Hamilton. Thank you. I'd like to address two questions today. How has the Internet affected the avail availability of information of civic importance in a diverse range of viewpoints on civic and political issues? And what trends should the FCC take into account as it conducts its review of media ownership r rules? The recent Knight Commission report informing communities identified four main types of information needs that communities have. Coordination, a sense of connectedness, making collective decisions, and holding public officials accountable. In his book, The Economic Theory of Democracy, Anthony Downs identified four main information demands that individuals have. Consumer, that helps you get better products. Producer, that helps you do your job. Entertainment, that's just things that are fun for you to know. And voter. The first three types of uh, information demands work pretty well. If you don't consume the information, you don't get the benefit. But the fourth demand has a problem. If you think about your demand for information as a citizen, the low probability that your vote will actually have an impact means that most people, in the words of Anthony Downs, remain rationally ignorant about the details of politics because they have such a low probability of impact. People do have some type of information demand about politics, but it usually relates to duty. They feel an obligation as a citizen or diversion for them watching C-SPAN is as enjoyable as watching ESPN or drama. That's politics as horse race or scandal. But what this means is that for hard news, there's not a high express demand. And it's also more relatively costly to produce because unlike other types of news like a sporting event, uh, people don't always want you to write about them if they are in government. And uh, that means that you have the problem of stories not told. Has the internet markedly changed this so that public affairs stories will undoubtedly be told? The answer to me is no. In the language of economics, 
information is a public good and holding government accountable is a public good. We'd all like to live in a community where people are reading stories about the local school board and holding officials accountable, but most of us free ride, leave that to other people, and that means that media companies cannot monetize the benefits of their civic coverage. The internet can make it easy to access and aggregate stories, but you cannot surf a story that's not told or created. The internet does make coordination and connectedness, two of the things that the Knight Commission talked about, much more feasible, especially through social media. And the internet does a wonderful job helping you serve your producer, consumer, or entertainment information demands. And it also allows you access to breaking uh, news. And a recent Pew Data uh, survey also found that 82% of internet users, which translates into 61% of all adult Americans, because not everybody is on the internet, 82% say that over the last year, they've looked for information or completed transactions on government websites. But that means that the rational ignorance that Anthony Downs identified a long time ago still uh, remains a problem at the local level. What's the imperfect evidence for this? Um, a Pew study that was released this year looked at a, a coverage in Baltimore. They looked at six major local stories, including budget, crime, and transit, for a week in 2009. And they found about 80% of the stories were repetitive. They contained no new information. Of the stories that did contain new information, about half were generated from newspapers, and about a third came from local TV. There was very little enterprise reporting from new media, such as blogs. And the th stories that are coming from traditional media are declining. Compared to 10 years ago, uh, for instance, the Baltimore Sun is producing one-third fewer stories on any topic. Additional evidence, the JLab looked at uh, coverage in Philadelphia and found that in the last three years, by any measure that you use, such as news hole, airtime, story count, or keyword searches, that there had been a huge drop in coverage of local public affairs, including a drop in local public affairs reporting by TV broadcasters. When the Free Press looked at independent local news sites in Chicago, they found that only a small percentage of stories, about 5%, had original reporting on hard news topics such as crime, local government, and politics. And the preliminary result from a study by Steve Wildman at Michigan State University shows that if you look at coverage across more than 100 markets of things like city councils, newspapers and TV stations dominate local news coverage. You get little new information created by local cable TV or citizen journalism sites. So that it appears if you're most concerned about local public affairs coverage, you might be most concerned about newspapers. And I don't have to tell the people in San Francisco that the newspaper markets are declining. If you look in the last three years, 32,000 jobs have been eliminated in newsrooms across the country. TV does provide local public affairs coverage, but that's a very small percentage of its total time. If you look online, online sites are generating are not generating significant local public affairs coverage, although that could change as you see standalone nonprofits such as Voice of San Diego or MinPost. If you look at broadcast markets, uh, what we're focusing on today, essentially what I found in my research is that you have spatial competition. Within a city, there's product differentiation. You have a high crime station, which talks about crime accident and disasters, and a low crime station, which talks more about education, business, and government. The, the amount of crime that's actually shown is not related to the FBI crime statistics. What I found in my research is the best predictor of the amount of crime in a local news broadcast is the ratings for COPS, the reality program in that area. And in fact, that's because local TV is very audience-driven. If you use People Magazine as your proxy for interest in soft news, I found in my content analysis that the higher percentage of households subscribing to People Magazine in an area, the more soft news there is in their local news. If you look at, uh, when I was looking at the late 1990s when Time Magazine had hard news in it, and I used that as a proxy for uh, hard news tastes, the more people who subscribe to Time Magazine in a market, the more likely local news was to have hard news in it, the more likely they were to cover the mayor and the U.S. senator, and the more people who subscribe to People magazine in the audience, the less likely 
the local TV broadcast was to cover the local U.S. senators or the mayor. More recent analysis by USC Annenberg confirms this spatial competition uh, phenomenon, and they looked at a snapshot of coverage of the L.A. market in 2009. They looked at, they found on average in 30 minutes of a newscast in which 16 minutes were not an ad, a teaser, sports, or weather, that only about eight minutes were devoted to local news, and that, again, there was this product differentiation. The, the high crime station had the lowest amount of civic coverage. So when I look at the evidence for public affairs coverage, and when I look at studies, studies such as Annenberg's study of local broadcast coverage in uh, October 2004, where they found that the ratio of candidate ad time to election news was 6 to 1 for Senate races and 6 to 1 for House races, with only 8% of broadcasts even mentioning the local races. When I review this evidence, I do not believe that the public interest is defined by public interest or that the existence of the Internet is going to guarantee the creation of local public affairs information. In the language of economics, positive externalities or positive spillovers are associated with local hard news. And because the newspaper and because the TV station cannot monetize those benefits, that type of coverage will be underprovided. And it's still the case that there's a huge fixed cost to discovering and creating stories. And so simply because the Internet provides access and aggregation, it doesn't mean that it's going to lead to the creation of local public affairs coverage. So theory and evidence both point to the continued existence of market failure in the coverage of local public affairs. That doesn't mean that a particular FCC policy is going to be corrective, but it does mean that it's important for the FCC to examine this market. If you think about the incentives people have to create information about public affairs, it could be, I want to sell your attention to advertisers. It could be, I want you to pay me that subscription. It could be, I want you to vote for me. It could be, I'd like to change the world and change what you think about. That's the nonprofit model. Or it could be expression. I would simply like you to listen to my ideas. All of those incentives, advertising, subscription, voting, nonprofit, and expression, all of them have a bias, biases relating to the distribution of income or education or human capital. All of them are influenced by public policies. And so what I hope is that the FCC, the FTC, and even the IRS and the NSF, the National Science Foundation, will consider how their decisions affect these different incentives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hamilton. Uh, Mr. Joyce. My name is Jim Joyce, and I'm the president of the National Association of Broadcast Employees and Technicians, which is the broadcasting and cable workers sector of the Communications Workers of America, otherwise known as NABIT CWA. Our union represents 9,000 workers in radio, television, at network and local stations around the country. In total, with our parent union, CWA, we represent 700,000 workers in communications, media, airlines, manufacturing, and public service in the United States, Canada, Puerto Rico, and around the world. Our sister union within side of a CWA, the Newspaper Guild, represents an additional 28,000 media workers. I'd like to thank the FCC for holding this workshop and for the opportunity to speak on the issues that are confronting our industry and affecting the people I represent. Innovation and the changing marketplace are part of broadcasting, but so too is regulation, FCC oversight, and the requirements to serve the public interest. Our union has participated in the ownership proceedings since 2002 because we're concerned about cross-ownership, ownership of multiple TV stations in the same marketplace, otherwise known as duopolies, and now the new forms of ownership coordination and consolidation that have sprung up in the last couple of years. Specifically, we are concerned about shared services agreements and local news services that have recently appeared on the scene with employers working together in what we historically would have thought of as antitrust violations. What credit default swaps did unregulated to the financial services industries, shared services agreements and local news, news, local news services are threatening to do to the broadcast industry and the local communities they serve with similar devastation. 
Shared services agreements between two or more broadcast licensees in the same market essentially allow one station to take over the operation of a second station. They amount to the effective transfer of a broadcast license to a competitor, but without the trouble of filing with the FCC over the transfer. When a local TV station is essentially reduced to being a file cabinet containing the FCC-mandated public file and managed by only one person who appears to sell the commercial time, then we really don't have another diverse voice in the community or another independent and competitive source of news gathering for that market. This is underscored by the fact that the Communications Workers of America, in conjunction with media watchdog organizations such as Free Press, have identified at least 25 markets where stations have entered into shared services agreements. For example, Barrington Broadcasting and Granite Broadcasting simply swapped control of broadcasting in two cities where they used to compete in the Syracuse, New York, and Peoria, Illinois markets. One entire television station worth of news gathering workers were laid off in each city. Now, Granite Broadcasting runs WWEK, WHOI, and WAOE in Peoria, and Syracuse, WTVH, WSTM, and WSTQ are all operated out of one building, one studio, with one set of news crews on the street, those of Barrington Broadcasting. At WTVH, 40 workers lost their jobs with, a com uh, with that combination, but even more troubling is the fact that the Syracuse market lost a competing and different point of view in news coverage. Since our union didn't represent people in Peoria, we don't know the exact extent of job loss there, but we do know that the viewers in that community lost diversity of news coverage. In Hawaii, Raycom has entered into a shared services agreement to operate station KGMB in addition to KHNL and KFFV. Here again, we have the loss of newsroom jobs, the loss of diverse voices and news coverage, the loss of information gathering at the local level. Reducing the number of free and vibrant voices, providing information to the public, weakens the public discourse that is so essential for keeping democracy strong in this country. Our sister union, the Newspaper Guild, has seen a form of shared services agreements before, but they were called joint operating agreements in the world of newspapers. And it required an act of Congress, the Newspaper Preservation Act of 1970, to make them legal. Moreover, when Congress passed the Newspaper Preservation Act, it specifically mandated that where newspapers came together to share business operations, they were required to maintain separate news operations and personnel. And the statute, most importantly, required failing newspapers to get approval from the Department of Justice before they could enter into a joint operating agreement. By contrast, in shared services agreements and in local news sharing, we have the owners of television stations who have received licenses to use the public airwaves, consolidating their operations with no oversight or approval process. The debate about the impact of this innovation has not happened yet. Instead, the broadcasters simply decide they don't need FCC approval to start working in concert, in effect abandoning the public trust that has been given to them with their separate FCC broadcast licenses. As a result, no viewer can ascertain the origin of news content on each station, and there's not even a way to quantify the change in news content from one station to another. Local news sharing is another way in which broadcasters combine news gathering operations without FCC approval. Under local news sharing, stations decide together which stories to cover and send out one crew to cover the news. And worse, by implication as a result of these arrangements, these, LN, these LNS stations can decide collectively which stories not to cover within any market. The local news service idea started in January 2009 with NBC, an employer with whom David CWA has a 75-year bargaining relationship. They decided to gather news together with Fox and others initially in the Philadelphia market. Interestingly, in the 17 months since, we have seen this idea spread to at least 20 markets with hundreds of news gathering jobs lost as TV stations decide together each morning what stories to cover. The employers paint a rosy picture of jointly covering press conferences so that news crews can be freed up to cover enterprise stories, but this is a false portrait of what's really going on. Instead, there are fewer news crews on the streets in these cities and less dynamic independent news coverage and fewer antagonistic voices available to inform the public and deepen news coverage to feed our democracy. CBS, Fox, Tribune, NBC, Gannett, Raycom, Scripps, and Lynn TV are all now involved in local news sharing. They share services here in the Bay Area and in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Philadelphia, Washington, Boston, Detroit, Phoenix, Tampa, other major markets. 
It is essential that, at a minimum, broadcasters report lo local news sharing agreements to the FCC and inform the public through on-air notification that the programming was obtained by LNS. ABC, another television network with a decades-long bargaining relationship with Nabit CWA, does not participate in local news sharing services in any market where they ha own and operate stations. The job loss nationwide is hard to fully track yet because it is new, but to cite one example, at least 106 workers lost their jobs at the Fox-owned television stations in Los Angeles with the advent of local news services and other consolidations. Nationwide, hundreds more, 100 more staff jobs are gone, and daily hires phones no longer ring to cover the news in their mar market. In 2006, I testified at the El Segundo portion of the FCC ownership hearings in the Los Angeles area. At that time, Nabit and CWA were concerned over news gathering being done by duopolies in that market, KCAL CBS, which is owned by CBS, and KCOP KTTV, which is owned by Fox. At the time, the CBS duopoly was running the KCAL KCBS news operation in unison, so much so that I presented a video of the wrong station airing the other station's logo during each other's broadcast. However, Fox, to their credit, was running a separate news operation with separate reporters and editorial staffs for their duopoly at KCOP KTTV. Sadly, in the intervening time since the last FCC ownership rules review, the consolidation of news gathering has run rampant. In the case of KCOP and KTTV, Fox has now combined one separate newsrooms into one, with only one set of reporters and editorial staff uh, and uh, the KCOP newscast is now indistinguishable from the newscast on KTTV, and that's in Los Angeles, the nation's second largest TV market. This makes a mockery of the FCC's longstanding media goals to promote diversity, competition, and localism in exchange for a broadcaster's right to use the public airwaves. At the very least, we think that owners should be required to tell the FCC on a regular basis how much news on their air is being gathered by other ent entities. Now let me state unequivocally that we believe in innovation and a changing marketplace. We would hardly have been representing people in broadcasting for 75 years if we didn't. But we believe strongly that broadcasters who receive FCC licenses to use the public airwaves must use our shared property to provide the public with unique news and entertainment programming. Anything less is essentially stealing a public good for a private benefit. Finally, I want to add a few comments about the pending Comcast purchase of NBC Universal. A Comcast takeover of NBC would create a media Goliath that would have the market power to control what we as consumers see and how much we as consumers pay to see it on all our media outlets, television, cable, and online. Comcast is the nation's largest cable company, broadband provider, and owner of multiple regional sports networks and cable networks. NBC Universal owns 27 television stations. I urge the FCC to hold public hearings on this proposed transaction to weigh the evidence carefully and to make sure that the public interest in a diverse competitive media environment is upheld. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Joyce. Uh, Mr. Mutter. Thank you. My name is Alan Mutter, and uh, I I guess I am the publisher of Reflections of a Newsasaur. Since it's not a household word, it's a blog that I've been writing for about five years on the impact of technology on the media business. In addition to publisher, I'm the editor, and I clean up. It's a one-man job, me and my dog. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the threat that I see to the economics of local broadcasting, and my full comments are available outside. I'm going to summarize them here. I believe that uh, the economics of local broadcasting may unravel as dramatically in the next five years as they did in the last five years for newspapers. The reason in both cases will be the unparalleled consumer choice made possible by a growing content of content, most of it free, on the Internet. Once it's as easy to watch YouTube as it is to watch Two and a Half Men or to play Farmville, from the comfort of your easy chair on your flat screen TV in the den, it will, it will instantaneously and forever fragment the audiences, the large audiences now uh, enjoyed by local TV broadcasters. Uh, at that point, the traditional mass advertising, mass media market, uh, mass media business model now enjoyed by broadcasters will fragment, will break, 
probably irretrievably, and that will uh, utterly upend the economics of the business. Local broadcasting in the very best days and the most tightly run chips in the market were able to produce profits of 50 cents on every dollar of ad sales. Profit margins today are down closer to 20 to 30 percent, in part uh, because of the kind of cutbacks that were just outlined by uh, Mr. Joyce and Professor Hamilton. Uh, so local news already has, has been degraded. But if the complete economic model of local broadcasting is unhinged, as I think it may be, then uh, we are looking at an even greater degradation of local TV coverage than we've seen to date. And it could be a very big problem for our democracy, which depends on authoritative news. T local TV news in, is, is, is cited as the number one location for uh, public affairs information uh, in most studies of the uh, media population in the United States. Now, any number of technologies could threaten local TV. One of them might be Google TV, which was just announced this week and which I didn't address in my prepared remarks because they were prepared before Google's announcement. But what Google TV does, in short, is to marry your Internet feed with a TV feed and push them both into a box on top of a TV or into a TV that's equipped for Internet TV, as Sony plans to deliver shortly. Another possible threat would be IPTV, which is Internet Protocol Television. And what that is is using the same uh, Internet technology that drives the Internet or voice over IP to deliver between 50 and 100 megabits per second of power into the flat top box in the living room. That's not, not flat top, sorry, flat panel. You, you get a flat top from watching it if you watch it long enough, but it's a flat panel. Consumers would be equipped with perhaps iPad-like remote controls that would enable them to mix and remix anything coming into the pipe. It could be news, entertainment, shopping, games, music, messaging, and I don't really know what else because it hasn't been invented yet. This will be good news for consumers because it will give them an enormous amount of choice, but it will be a challenge for broadcasters because it will fragment the audience, and fragmented audiences will break the traditional broadcast model. This will have the heaviest impact on local broadcasters because that is their only business. While cable channels are already geared to serving small niche audiences and oftentimes are paid by, uh, uh, by the cable networks and the satellite networks, um, they, their, their model already anticipates fragmented audiences. In fact, it lives on that. For the networks, ABC, NBC, Fox, and others, uh, they will be able to uh, download shows individually on, uh, over the Internet, making them available to users in their living room. And uh, they also may, be, in fact, begin to charge for programming. They'll either do that through their own um, websites or perhaps through services like Hulu. But shattered audiences will deprive local broadcasters of the vast reach that enabled high ad rates and enviable profits long associated with their businesses. Now, only 8% of households today have access to IPTV, but uh, an analyst named Lee Ratliff, who covers this closely at a firm called iSupply, projects that around a fifth of the homes, or 20% of the homes, will have IPTV within five years. 20% is a very significant number for those of us who have watched the demise, or at least I should say the decline, of the newspaper industry. In the year 2003, uh, was the first time that 20% of the homes in the United States had access to broadband, DSL, or cable modems that enabled uh, fairly inexpensive and reliable uh, rapid Internet service into their homes. Um, in the year, uh, and, and at that point, the, the, the size of the newspaper business began to diminish. Um, whereas 48% of Americans said they read a, daily, read a daily newspaper when the Internet was in its infancy in 1998, 25% of Americans now today read a newspaper in print. The plunge in newspaper revenues was just as dramatic. Although newspaper ad sales remained healthy through 2005, even as newspaper circulation began to degrade, um, newspaper advertising revenues began a dizzying and still unabated decline in 2006. And that was the first year that broadband was installed in about a third of the nation's homes. 
So now newspaper sales were only $28 billion in 2009 versus $49 billion in 2005. That's almost half of the industry's principal revenue base up in smoke. Now, some of that was the result of the economic slowdown in these last few years, but a great deal of it was not, and a great deal of it will not return. Um, innumerable independent surveys consistently have found that consumers, particularly those under the age of 30, are attracted to digital media that enable them to manage information as readily as they manage the playlists on their iPods. Uh, once traditional TV programming is married with a robust internet feed to the family entertainment center, and those are seamlessly integrated and easily manipulated, once that happens, there's every reason to believe most modern consumers will take active control of the time they spend in front of the tube. The consumer will be decidedly unpredictable, if not downright fickle. This will play havoc with the traditional broadcast model, which depends on assembling large audiences. As ad revenues, as audiences shrink, ad revenues will shrink. As ad revenues shrink, profits will be challenged, and broadcasters will have to move to cut expenses, as you've already heard they've been doing in the last few years during the slowdown in the economy. A contraction in the local TV business will have a direct consequence on local news coverage. When you think about that, combined with the curtailment of newspaper coverage, as tens of thousands of reporters have lost their jobs in recent years and newspapers have shrunk down their news hull, uh, we're going to have a real shortage of authoritatively reported information that is the livelihood of any healthy democracy. And in fact, it will be unprecedented in the history of this republic. I have also must say that I've seen nothing yet to convince me that crowdsourced websites could possibly fill the void that will be lost by professional journalism. Um, Professor Hamilton a moment ago uh, discussed the USC study uh, regarding how little time is spent in a 30-minute newscast on news, particularly on local news. Um, as he noted, uh, perhaps eight minutes of the 30-minute uh, local newscast in L.A. is actually given to local news. And here's what else the researchers had to say at USC. One out of three broadcasts led with crime. Nearly half of those were about murder, robbery, assault, kidnapping, property crime, traffic crime, and other common crime. A fourth of the crime news leads were about celebrity crime. And nearly a fourth of the crime leads were about crimes that didn't even take place in the Los Angeles media market, although I would think they produce enough there to, to, to not have to import crime. With the gruel that we call local TV news quite thin, our society can ill afford further cutbacks, but yet this may be the path we are on. Unless local broadcasters begin acting affirmatively and aggressively to explore new business models and ways of serving their audiences, they run a real danger of squandering the valuable advantages they enjoy as a result of the licenses granted to them by the FCC. In my comments, I urge the FCC to look closely into what local broadcasters are doing to develop innovations in their business model that will protect them against the inevitable changes that will occur in the fragmentation of their audience and the destruction of the mass media model. Specifically, I would urge the Commission to look into what broadcasters are doing with the new channels that have been generated under the uh, switch to digital broadcasting. Here in the Bay Area, those channels are basically being wasted, and it's a shame because we have any number of innovative uh, uh, individuals and companies here, including uh, my friend at the far end of the panel, who would love to be working in partnership with broadcasters. I think if broadcasters don't act in their own enlightened self-interest to begin to explore a way to preserve the value and to sustain the value of their franchises, then I think perhaps it's time for the FCC to give them a nudge. Thank you very much for a very stimulating set of presentations. I'll begin the questioning, if I may, by picking up on the point that Mr. Mutter just uh, made. Um, you describe a scenario in which the availability of increased video over the Internet and the ability to see it on a large screen could essentially unzip the business model for broadcasters. I've heard some suggest that it might have a different set of implications, and I wonder whether you could comment on that, that, that the availability now of digital TV with high-definition pictures for free over the Internet, um, or, oh, excuse me, over the air, 
plus the increased availability of uh, video over the Internet might lead some people to feel that they no longer need to spend $90 or whatever it is for a pay TV service, and they might actually pull the plug and rely on over-the-air broadcast plus video in, l in lieu of their cable or satellite subscription. Do you see any likelihood of that? I, I think quite a number of people will uh, sustain uh, uh, pay services because they, it will enable them to get uh, heavy bandwidth that they can't otherwise get for their – as the Internet becomes more and more important to families, they're going to be wanting plenty of bandwidth in and out of the household. So that's one of the main things that the pay providers are providing. And I also believe um, uh, that, uh, that, frankly, I've, I actually use digital – the digital system that's, that's been that replaced analog, and it's absolutely awful. It's unreliable, and I would certainly never want to try to surf the web over, over the air. So I think, I think the heavy bandwidth into the household uh, that every, almost every household that can afford it will require, I think that pretty much assures a, a pretty bright future for people in the pay TV business. If I might then, I, I don't know if any other members of the panel would like to comment on on the prospect of people relying on internet video plus over-the-air broadcast in lieu of a pay TV service. And I'll, I'll pick up on one of the points that Professor Hamilton made you. Uh, it's understood that I think one recent study indicated that 61 percent of the population on any given day will look at news on the internet. But as you mentioned, many studies suggest that the source of the content that's, that's viewed there tends to be on the traditional media. Uh, and that many of the websites they're going to are, are in fact, aggregator sites. Um, I wonder whether any of the panelists see today uh, any increasing amount of generation of new news content, new local news content uh, outside the traditional media, or you see a prospect for that, or will we continue to rely on the traditional media to generate the content and see the Internet principally as a, as a dissemination and aggregation mechanism? I don't mind jumping in, although I don't want to monopolize things. There's just absolutely tons of content on the Internet. Uh, the problem is we don't know who's creating it. We don't know why they're creating it. We don't know whether to believe it. And, of course, we don't know if any of it is true. Uh, we're never going to be at a loss for something to read or watch or look at or, or places where we can post our pictures of our vacation or our uh, videos of our cat water skiing. That's not the problem. The problem is we don't have professionally reported uh, 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 information that, that comes out of the tradition of journalism that, frankly, uh, with all its flaws, has worked pretty well this far. You might see um, more standalone public affairs, local news sites like MinPost or Voice of San Diego or Texas Tribune, which are basically saying to the people in their area, uh, we're going to cover the things that are being cut back by uh, traditional media, and we're going to do it at a very low salary rate, and you could have 10 people, uh, 15 people um, covering the school board and the city council, and they're relying right now on startup money from the Knight Foundation and from other foundations, but they're hoping, it's an experiment, it's an empirical question, they're hoping to develop a revenue stream from listeners and viewers like you. So they're trying to figure out, uh, almost like a, um, a consumption good, would you get a warm glow of altruism by sending them a tax-deductible donation? And so just like uh, NPR tries to fund some of its broadcasts that way, that is, that is one way that we might get some additional coverage. But, again, government policy is implicated in that. If you look at the IRS uh, decisions, it's unclear the degree that they would accept nonprofit media covering public affairs with a heavy, heavy advertising component because some of these sites have advertising. And down the road, they, they could be challenged. And also, the degree that they hold government accountable that could, they are nonprofits today, that could be challenged by people who lose elections and want to use the IRS strategically. So I think um, if you have hope about local nonprofits, maybe L3Cs uh, covering public affairs, uh, the IRS could help those flourish or at least help them experiment if it removed the uncertainty about the tax treatment of nonprofit media. We, we, 
We have experimented with citizens' journalism in our group. I mean, we started an experiment at our station in Nashville about five years ago, and there, there are two issues with it at this point. You know, and citizens' journal journalism obviously are, are people that aren't necessarily on the payroll, the television station, out covering stories, generating content, that sort of thing, which I do think has tremendous possibilities down the road, but there are two issues with it. A Alan mentioned one of them is just simply verification of material. The second thing is, uh, and, and I think we'll, we will fix the second issue before we easily fix the first issue, um, Despite the fact that everybody has a cell phone camera uh, or can take video with their cell phone or has a home video camera, people really aren't trained yet in generating this type of content, you know, at, at the type of level that we could use and posting it or providing it for use by traditional broadcasters. That said, I was at uh, the Medill School uh, for Journalism at Northwestern University a couple of months ago uh, interviewing students for potential jobs in our group. Every single student that I talk to is totally self-contained now. They can, with no problem, and in fact, uh, they're excited about the idea of going out on their own, shooting, writing, editing, posting, finding ways to distribute the stories that they cover. And <clears throat> th that wave of new reporters and that wave of new content is not far behind us, in, in my opinion. And it's something that, you know, obviously, we want to use that. Um, I, I don't think anybody on the panel or anybody in the audience would, would argue that whether it's local broadcasters, the Internet, whoever provides the content, we do need to dig deeper, and we do need to provide more diverse content. Uh, the question is, how do we get there? And as somebody that's been in the news game for 28 years, I look at it and, and really see us as we're in a transition period right now. There are... There are is a wave of new people with new skills, new abilities, and new ideas that are about to hit the market that will help us change and hopefully provide that diversity in content, more voices, and more enterprise, and more of an enterprise approach to reporting. I also think we're at the beginning of figuring out a model that would work to make the most of people wanting to participate in citizen journalism. Um, and I do think that's there has been, or foundations have played the role of helping to fund um, problems that the market doesn't solve. Um, so things like the Huffington Post Investigative Fund or ProPublica are both non or, are nonprofit entities of some sort that um, fund investigative journalism in a very new media context. Um, and whether or not uh, ProPublica is showing that it does work, but in other cases, um, such as what we're doing with the Knight Foundation, which is funding Miro Community, um, so to help fund the local journalism through our technology tools, um, we're really trying to work out what that model looks like. So that, uh, and, and there will be various models, um, but I think once there's some proof of concept, um, local journalism can come with greater participation from other people, um, from various people, um, but I do think there is a role as well for government policy to play um, to allow to also go after the problems that the market can't fix. I'd like to circle back to what I think was uh, Mr. Lake's uh, initial uh, premise uh, in asking the question, which is, uh, are these traditional broadcasters populating uh, new original content uh, on some of the other platforms they have available to them, whether it's the secondary digital channels or uh, the Internet. And uh, uh, I believe the answer is very, very little, if, if any at all, in specific markets. Uh, what you see uh, at, at the network level um, uh, with own owned stations, uh, if they are broadcasting news on their uh, uh, secondary digital channel, uh, they are uh, just time-shifting uh, replays of earlier newscasts uh, or of network newscasts. Uh, the only time you'll see uh, original news programming on those channels and on some of the uh, me uh, Internet outlets they have is for major breaking news stories. Uh, ABC News has a, uh, an Internet service. They don't have their own cable news network. They have a, a, an outlet called ABC News Now, which... Uh, repeats uh, ABC network news shows such as Nightline, Good Morning America. Uh, it also features uh, more personal pieces like uh, 
how to uh, best invest your money uh, and, and uh, you know, housekeeping uh, items. Uh, they only carry original content if there's breaking news going on. The same is true of MSNBC. Uh, they carry uh, web versions of, of stories that have aired uh, earlier on the network in terms of text. They uh, uh, replay uh, uh, stories that you can download or stream by hitting a, cl uh, a link on their website, stories that have already aired on NBC, but they provide very, very little original content uh, unless there's a breaking news situation. Can I actually ask a question about original reporting? And this comes up in the context of economies of scale and efficiencies, which we've heard a lot about throughout the day. Um, I'll start with Mr. Grief, and I, but I'd love to hear from the entire, entire panel on this. If you have a situation where you are sharing reporting or you're engaging in other agreements with various broadcasters, newspapers, you know, you name it, to try to, to get more people on the ground and do other things, how do you ensure that there are you know, is kind of original reporting. So let's assume that there's an additional eight hours of local news. How do we ensure that you have an eight hours of original reporting, the other station has eight hours, rather than everybody has two hours and then the other six hours are just regurgitating what, what's been replayed before? <clears throat> my, my personal feeling, and, and I said before, I mean, I, I've been in the news business exclusively in the news business for 28 years in a variety of different roles. As a, as a one-man band reporter, uh, an anchor for three newscasts, as I mentioned earlier, a producer, news director in a variety of different markets. And I, I, think, I don't know that I can absolutely ensure that it, you know, sharing or um, you know, these sharing agreements or shared content is in all cases in all stations going to lead to enterprise reporting or a greater emphasis on diverse reporting. I can tell you, you know, for our group and our philosophy, the 10 television stations we work with, we see this as a way because we see a demand from consumers, a demand from viewers, a demand from the public for more in-depth reporting. The issue we have right now, I've talked about this transition period we're in, and, and the incredible contraction that we've seen over the past couple of years, that it's difficult to move right now with all of the options in front of us and coming through that contraction to move to a model where we best serve the needs of the viewers. And I'll, I'm going to try and break it down into, in, into uh, uh, something that I talk to our news managers about all the time. We talk about, we talk about content. We do regular calls with our news directors in the group, and we talk about content. What type of content do viewers want, and how do we move to a model that serves the, need of the needs of the viewers? And we talk about two types of content every day. We talk about relevant content and interesting content. Right? TV people tend to gravitate more towards interesting content because it's easier and cheap to produce. You know, a fire... Um, Crime, fires, those sorts of things. And, you know, being in the business for a long time, I was taught early on that those were the stories that you want because you've got great video, you've got emotional sound. Uh, that's what viewers want. And, and we know, especially after what's happened in the world over the past several years, that viewers are less interested in the interesting content and there's a great hunger for relevant content. And we've tried to talk to our managers and talk to our newsrooms about moving more towards relevant versus interesting content. And, and that's the direction we're trying to go into. In Cron, as I at Cron, as I mentioned earlier, we've shifted to a new model for reporting. We've expanded the amount of news. Uh, we've put a greater emphasis on local reporting. Earlier I mentioned the five political specials that we're doing this month. The two issues that, that keep us at this point from really moving forward towards more relevant reporting are, uh, number one, the contraction. Uh, TV newsrooms have not been built, and the mindset of TV newsrooms is not go after the relevant stories. Those aren't good TV stories. They're difficult and expensive to produce, so go after the interesting content. A lot of it has to, has to do with, and what we need to do, are train people to recognize interesting content and how to tell interesting, uh, the interest, or, I'm sorry, the relevant content how to recognize it and how to, how to deliver it, how to report it. It's a different skill set to report on uh, the Oakland Police Department considering cutting 200 police officers. The video's not great. The sound's not great. There's a different way to report that. And again, we're seeing a different type of reporter and a different type of producer come into newsrooms now that are more capable of delivering those types of stories. 
The other thing has just been the ec economics of it, trying to rebuild the systems and rebuild the way you cover news and how your newsrooms are operated. That's where I do think that some additional content sharing makes sense. You know, there are commodity stories, stories that everybody is going to cover that will make their way into every newscast that don't necessarily need five cameras there. It, and and uh, maybe it's just me as a, as a longtime news person, maybe I'm naive, but the, the reason we're interested in more sharing is because we firmly believe that in a model going forward, if stations share commodity news, it frees up people to do investigative and enterprise reporting. Now, you mentioned earlier all the job losses over the past couple of years, and I'm sure that some of those are, re are the re direct result of sharing. You know, the, the cause and effect, I don't, I don't know. I'm just a news guy. I think a lot of that has to do with just the contraction and the change in the way that uh, the business is moving at this point. My interest in additional content sharing isn't to cut jobs, isn't to uh, reduce the number of people in the newsroom or decrease the, you know, the quality of the news. I see it as a viable way for us to free additional people up to, to cover the relevant news. I'll give you an example. This week in San Francisco, we had a, a bomb scare down on Union Square. And it affected thousands of people. I happened to be down there when they roped, you know, roped the streets off and evacuated Union Square. Thousands of people wanted to know what happened. And by the time I left, I had no idea what had happened. That's a story that I think in, in a lot of cases could be, could be covered by one camera and shared by multiple stations so crews could go out, newsrooms could go out, and spend more time and dedicate more people to look at the budget crisis that... Uh, the communities are facing in this area, dig into the Oakland Police Department's uh, interest in reducing the police force by 200 people. Uh, well, I think we have a perfect example of why local news sharing doesn't work in terms of fully, fully serving the community, and uh, that example is this proceeding. Is local news sharing here? No. The only station that was here this morning was KGO. And they were doing this as an enterprise story. And guess what? They don't participate in local news sharing. They figured that this story had all the elements that Mr. Greif was just talking about. It was uh, in the public interest because this is a proceeding about uh, democracy. It was relevant because it's local. The FCC comes to the Bay Area uh, for their uh, quadrennial ownership rules review. Uh, that, that's an important story in my view. And uh, LNS decided not to cover this important proceeding, and that should speak volumes. I've got a question uh, for Mr. Nutter. Um, I, I was interested in your statement that you felt that the FCC should somehow hold licensees accountable for what they're doing in terms of news and information for the future health of the industry and specifically what they're doing with their uh, multicast channels, television stations, and I guess radio stations, too, that are operating in high definition. Specifically, what would you have us do? What would you have us look at? And what would be the ramifications if somebody somehow fell short of whatever the metric was? I, I actually think that um, I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing for some... Uh, governmental prescription or proscription on the part of the FCC. But I think, just as you're holding this hearing today and trying to identify the issues that ought to be explored, I think the issue of innovation in the industry ought to be explored. Now, I started my career as a newspaper man, and I have this thing about newspapers. I'm just emotionally into newspapers. I can't help myself. And I really want I think they're important institutions, and I'd like to see them stay in business. The fact is, left to their own devices in the last five, seven, ten years, publishers have manifestly failed to innovate sufficiently to the point that they can succeed. Uh, they, may be, they may be unable to succeed indefinitely into the future. I think since nobody regulates newspapers, but you all do regulate uh, broadcasters, you specifically told them they had to put up the digital channels. Now we have them, and now when I go to channel 7-2 or 7-3 or whatever it is, all I see is, is the weather radar, which, honestly, uh, I can do that 
from my, my iPhone? Why would I go all the way to the other room and try to get a signal off digital just to see that? So I think that in as much as that these licenses are operating uh, at, for, for the public benefit and you regulate those licenses with all due respect, it seems to me that from time to time you ought to inquire into how well the licenses are being managed. Uh, when we talk about you know, local, how much local news is on, and, and KRON does a lot of enterprise news, and so I, I really have to, I have to say here in, in the Bay Area that it's a notable exception. But many of the other stations take the same stories and put them on a wheel, and you recycle them every 15, 20, 30 minutes. So there may be hours and hours of programming, but it's not original programming. It's the same old stuff. Uh, so again, I do believe it's within, I, in, as a layman, it's within the, it's within the uh, ability and purview of the FCC to ask these guys, okay, you have this license, you have this valuable asset, what are you doing with it? Anybody else? Mr. Greif? Well, <clears throat> what we're doing with our digital spectrum as sort of the new strategist for the group may be above my pay grade, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer it this way. We recognize the importance of it. We recognize the value of it. Um, again, I look at what's happened with the contraction in the broadcast economy, and in everyone that I know that's involved in local television, the biggest question in front of them at this point is, what's the best use, what's the best approach with that additional digital, those additional digital channels? And um, it's not, that, uh, it's not that we want it to go to waste. Uh, it's not that we're dragging our feet there. It, it is a significant investment. We do want it to be about additional quality content. Um, it's how do you get there. And as I said in my remarks, there are a number of options. There are a number of different directions that broadcasters can go with those additional channels. And I, I think the consensus in the business is, you know, we need a little bit more information and we need a little bit more time so we do something of quality with that additional space. Uh, you know, I, I'd love it if, if, you know, the additional space that we have at Cron was filled already and was working, was valuable, and, and was a successful model. There are, it's a fork in the road and, and honestly we're not quite sure which direction is the best direction to go in. I don't think that it's, it's going to be an extended period of time before we figure that out develop models and, and put that, you know, put that valuable space to work. It's, um, you, you know, it's, it, it really is, we want to make sure that we're making the right choice at this point in, in the direction that we go in. When I look at the local broadcast stations, my assumption is what they're doing is uh, maximizing profits in a very difficult economic environment. And so the problem that you all have always had is that um, there's a market failure involved. You'd like companies to do something that's not profit maximizing. You'd like them to provide some sort of public interest, public goods programming. And the First Amendment makes it very difficult for you to do that. In a way, they get their licenses for free in, uh, and promise to broadcast in the public interest but everybody on the panel knows that that's very hard to define. And if you were very explicit about it, it would probably violate the First Amendment. So what actually happens is they broadcast maximized profits. It's very difficult for you to change their behavior. And economists have a word for that. It's called incentive compatibility. So one thing that could happen is if you charged a spectrum fee uh, and said, okay, broadcast what you would in the public interest, they would still broadcast a lot of as much news almost as they do now because it can be profitable and then you could use that spectrum fee for something else maybe for the support of nonprofit media and that would be incentive compatible for nonprofit media because the folks who go into that accept a lower pay for the uh, idea that they're doing the right thing to, to pick up on that um, at a recent workshop we had on the future of public media one suggestion was made that uh, because if the resources of the commercial broadcasters are being strapped, the, the uh, editorial resources, the report, reporting, that we should rely more on public media as our source of hard news uh, and give greater financial support from the government to the public media. Do, do any of you think that's a sensible 
strategy, and would you worry at all about relying increasingly on government support for things such as investigative reporting? Well, um, I don't want to be the public interest spokesperson, uh, but I, I was at that workshop, and the interesting thing was that public media today doesn't provide, as you know, a lot of local coverage or local investigative news coverage. But if you look at NPR and you uh, listen to what they're doing with their experiments, they're recognizing the news hole created by the decline in newspapers, and they want to become more involved in this and more involved in investigative uh, reporting. Um, so to me, all information comes with a bias in the creation of its incentive, and you just have to decide what type of bias you would be willing to accept. So we're, I guess that's a startling comment for some, but um, we're, we're basically trading off imperfect markets, imperfect government, imperfect nonprofits. It would have been more impressive with the tablets had shattered. <laughs> I, I, I'd just like to reiterate again, and, and again, I can, I, I'm only speaking for young broadcasting and, and from my experience in that group. Uh, in, in the direction we want to go in and how we try and serve the interests of the public. Um, you know, Cron is an example. Uh, under very difficult economic conditions, we have worked very hard not to give up on local news, uh, not to substitute with something that's profit-maximizing or easy to produce. We could easily go to um, you know, all barter syndicated programming and run, you know, 24 hours of infomercials. Instead, we've expanded in the year and a half I've been there. We've added two hours of local news a day. Um, the way I look at this is you have local broadcasters, local companies that have worked hard since they've gone on the air, going back to the 50s and 60s to serve their communities. And there was a model that worked for decades. And now we have all this new technology that makes any step you take potentially a big step to the good or a big step to the bad. And it's not that, again, we don't want to use the digital spectrum or we're wasting the digital spectrum or in these times of the changing model where there are more opportunities and the pie gets sliced thinner that our only goal is to cut people and decrease the quality we're in, a, we're in transition, and, you know, we would like a little bit of support as local broadcasters, a little bit of support and a little bit of, of time to figure out which is the right direction to go in. And, again, I said it a couple of times. I don't think anyone on the panel uh, would disagree that broadcasters, news reporters, the news media in general can do a better job, um, you know, in the position that I'm in, that's what I want to achieve. The question is, how do we do it at this time after a severe contraction? And what's the best model going forward? And how do we figure that out? Do we get there through increased regulation? Or do we get there through allowing the people in the companies that have served their local communities? And I can't speak for the networks, or I can't speak for newspapers or cable companies, but I can speak for local broadcast companies. <clears throat> How do we get there? Do we get there through time and some, a little bit more time, a little bit of evaluation, and a little bit of flexibility? Or do we get there through additional regulation? In my previous, one of my previous lives, I was uh, in the cable TV business, and I was chief operating officer of a national MSO, which is multiple system operator. And in our franchises, many times, we had a public access requirement where we had to dedicate channels and sometimes even brought uh, facilities, studios, to uh, individuals opening, essentially, open mic for that channel. Now, perhaps one model that would work would be to say, if you have three uh, digital channels, Mr. Broadcaster, maybe you need to turn over one of them to some form of mediated public access. Uh, we, in cable business, we had some pretty awful stuff put up on our public access channels, but maybe some sort of a requirement like that, if there is no other programming, is one way to open it up. I should think that Tiffany would be delighted to help, uh, to help fill some air uh, on one of these channels with her open video project, and there are many others just like them. I also think um, 
you know, in radio, you have the model of, uh, or the example of PRX, public radio exchange, um, that sets up a, a system that allows um, more creation from the bottom up to feed into um, radio stations that can use that content um, and into, you know, bigger models that are, are similar to um, public broadcasting models. Um, and 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 you can do it. You can fund uh, public broadcasting to also um, fuel that kind of um, programming uh, um, uh, at, at the citizen or independent level as well. Um, and and I do have always been a, a advocate of something like collective licensing that allows um, creation across the board, um, allows people to pick programming. Um, and pay for that programming, um, and and you're really funding innovation from the bottom up. Um, and, and Miro, the purpose of Miro, is to allow everyone to have their own channel. Um, and with the addition of internet tools like that, um, there's more room for uh, more kinds of content. There's hyper local and niche content that could really fill up um, people's time in airwaves. Uh, I was going to say that NABIT CWA represents workers at NPR and PBS nationally uh, here in the Bay Area, KQED, and also at the WGBH in Boston, so relatively big players in the, in the public broadcasting world. Uh, and uh, you know, we've now crossed the digital divide. We've gone from analog. Uh, we're in the digital world. All options should be on the table right now and exploring ways to improve uh, the access that communities have to quality journalism. And one of those options uh, should be the very model that uh, Mr. Lake was suggesting, whether there should be uh, a subsidizing strictly for journalism to, uh, to fill the void. Uh, public broadcasting, as we all know, has faced uh, a number of challenges where they received uh, funding from uh, state and federal governments uh, that had been greatly reduced, uh, especially in 2009. It's back a little bit. But also because of a bad economy, uh, those regular contributors that uh, contribute to their local station don't have the means to do so anymore, uh, or at least uh, until uh, the economy improves. So in filing in a separate FCC proceeding, uh, if you're not familiar, there is a, a proceeding going on called the uh, Future of Media Project, which uh, Steve Waldman, uh, senior advisor to uh, uh, Chairman uh, Jenikowski, uh, uh, is uh, heading up. Uh, Bill Friedman from uh, the Media Bureau has been involved in that. In those comments, uh, we again stated all options should be on the table to find ways to improve uh, quality journalism that is local and diverse to communities, even if it means bolstering up uh, stations uh, that are uh, non-commercial. Um, let me... Uh change the focus just a little bit, although obviously still related to what we've been talking about. I've got a question that I, I suppose really goes to new, the news gathering process and how that may have changed um, with the uh, emergence of the internet and the online digital world that we're in right now. I'm thinking back to, uh, to two concepts that were talked a lot about when I was in J school um, a long time ago, um, agenda setting and gatekeeping. Um, those concepts were actually um, in the minds of policymakers back in the 1970s at the FCC when it first imposed its newspaper broadcast ban, for example. Um, policymakers then expressed concern about the position of those big media outlets, the only ones that really existed at that point in a serious way in journalism, which were newspapers and, and uh, broadcast stations. The role, role of those media outlets in controlling the flow of news and information to the public through the stories they chose to cover or chose not to cover, and through the sources they chose to interview, or chose not to interview. Um, today, however, it appears at least that there's a possibility that whatever power traditional media has had to gatekeep or set the news agenda has changed. Not only are there more outlets, um, at least to some degree, um, whether or not they're all as robust as every other one is obviously um, uh, not true. But nonetheless, there are more workarounds now, for example, with respect to stories that may get ignored by the traditional media that bubble up and get disseminated through online sources anyway. I'm thinking of the Genesis story in Mississippi, the high school kids who were um, 
uh, not treated well, were treated inequitably. Um, and that story didn't get picked up by the local media. Uh, it got circulated on the internet. It then got picked up by the traditional media and became a big story, um, nationwide, in fact. Um, and on a, on a smaller scale, um, I know from a, a people who are still in the business of, as professional journalists, that their ability to reach out and find sources of interviews, um, f- quotes on any sort of subject now, is considerably different than what I had 20 years ago before the internet existed. You can put a question out on a website and get responses. Um, you can get responses, as, as newspaper sites in particular do, um, comments on stories, corrections to stories. Um, all this stuff seems to be changing um, the way that the traditional news media anyway um, are changing their position with respect to whatever kind of agenda setting and gatekeeping power they might have had. Do you have a view on this issue? And if so, could you share your thoughts? Any? Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I, you know, again, as somebody that oversees news strategy for 10 local stations, um, I can honestly tell you that we won't avoid a story because it's on the Internet. We don't look at it and say that's already been covered in the Internet, uh, you know, by a source on the Internet, so we're going to avoid that story. Um, if it's a good story that, that meets our criteria for relevant content, we'll take it on, and we'll, we'll do the best that we can to cover it with our local resources. Um, the, the Internet has been a, 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 a very good tool for us in terms of reporting, uh, access to information. Um, we, we use the Internet at Cron in a variety of ways every single day. It could be using, simply using Google Earth to explain uh, where something's happening or what's happening. Uh, it could be sourcing information on the Internet for a story that we run uh, on one of our newscasts. Um, we regularly receive and, and use uh, viewer video, uh, viewer comments, uh, information that viewers have sent to us via the Internet. So we've seen it as a positive tool, not, not a negative tool, certainly nothing that, that sways our editorial direction one way or the other on a daily basis. You know, and I think in terms of gatekeepers, it's, you know, my experience with local television station newsrooms is they still think the same way. They still try to cover the same stories given the resources that they have right now. And the Internet is an, is an additional separate resource that, that uh, you know, the public can go to for a variety of other different opinions or information on the same story that they might have seen on the local news that night. I think it depends on um, the level of government you're talking about. If you're talking about... Uh, say, national public affairs, that it's clear that people have many more outlets to choose from, and you can get one that's closer to your ideological ideal point now. And so that's more diverse. It reduces the gatekeeping and agenda function, in part because you're able to get your worldview reflected back to you. And in, and in the old days, you weren't. There, You were consuming something that you might have disagreed with. So uh, at the national level, I think that you're right that those two things are uh, concepts that you might worry about less. But thinking about the local level, I live in a media market. I think it's the 27th largest media market in the U.S. There aren't very many outlets creating stories. And so if you think about agenda setting uh, or gatekeeping, I wish there were still gatekeepers uh, in in the following sense. Uh, The paper that I read, the News and Observer, has gone from 260 to less than 100 people in the newsroom in four years. And if you ask the editor who he fired, it was the county court reporter, the education reporter, the reporter who used to cover migrant workers, the reporter who used to cover the banking industry. Um, They used to set the agenda in our area on those stories. Those issues are off the table in terms of a lot of locally created content. So... I sort of missed the agenda setting and gatekeeping function for the people who were fired. Okay. I just have, I guess, one final question. Um, so, you know, we've heard a lot from all of the panelists today, and we've received a lot of information. So I'm going to ask you guys to play FCC for a little bit. 
as we are looking at the media ownership rules that we need to revisit, what are the most important factors that you think that we should consider as we think about modification of our existing rules? I'll start with Mr. Mutter and head on down. Well, I, I am not a student of the media ownership rules, I must confess, so I can't specifically address them. But the idea uh, that cross ownership, uh, that that the, the, that m multiple outlets in the same market can combine and somehow help their business, um, there are some, uh, there can be some short-term gain to that. But I have to point out to you that in the newspaper industry, the joint operating agreements where the governments did essentially give multiple publishers uh, uh, antitrust waivers to uh, collaborate, that many of the newspapers, the biggest newspapers that failed in the last few years, were in these joint ownership arrangements, the Rocky Mountain News, the Seattle Post Intelligencer, uh, among them. Um, well, I, while it may be palliative in some cases to enable this, I think it's a false hope to think that that is a solution to what I believe is a structural and secular challenge to the local mass media broadcast model, as I mentioned in my comments. So the, this may give some short-term relief, but it's not going to be a long-term solution to ensure a healthy uh, broadcast infrastructure, which will then assure healthy local journalism. I think... Uh the same three subjects that have been uh, the focus of the last two uh, ownership rule reviews uh, should be the focus of uh, this go-around, and that is uh, preserving uh, the cross-ownership ban, uh, not allowing for further consolidation by increasing multiple ownership in any market, or by increasing uh, the national audience share uh, that any entity is allowed uh, to have in the, in the nation. None of these things, if they're expanded, in my view, are, are good for democracy. Uh, we've already had many of examples uh, uh, spoken here today uh, and uh, were brought up in previous proceedings uh, that reflects the com public's concern about uh, uh, widening uh, the latitude on uh, those three uh, points uh, regarding the ownership view rules. As an economist, I'm really looking forward to reading the economic studies that are going to come out. <laughs> Just that's teasing. right. No, no, that's, that's why they call it the dismal science. Um, so I'm really looking forward to those, to those studies to see. Um, I guess when I look at the comments that have been filed so far, I'm not as optimistic, obviously, that the existence of the Internet makes the positive externalities problems go away. And... Um, I know that ownership is one rule that you have, but I'm also very happy that sh in another part of the FCC, in the future of media, that you're looking at many different policies to address these market failures. From a local broadcast
further consolidation by increasing multiple ownership in any market or by increasing uh, the national audience share uh, that any entity is allowed uh, to have in the, in the nation. None of these things, if they're expanded, in my view, are, are good for democracy. Uh, we've already had many of examples uh, uh, spoken here today uh, and uh, were brought up in previous proceedings uh, that reflects the public's concern about uh, uh, widening uh, the latitude on uh, those three uh, points uh, regarding the ownership rules. As an economist, I'm really looking forward to reading the economic studies that are going to come out. <laughs> Just teasing. That's right. No, no, that's, that's why they call it the dismal science. Um, so I'm really looking forward to those, to those studies to see. Um, I guess when I look at the comments that have been filed so far, I'm not as optimistic, obviously, that the existence of the Internet makes the positive externalities problems go away. And um, I know that ownership is one rule that you have, but I'm also very happy that in another part of the FCC, in the future of media, that you're looking at many different policies to address these market failures. From a local broadcaster's point of view, I think, you know, we're hoping for two things from the FCC, and that's time and freedom. And I'm not suggesting no regulation, certainly. Um, you know, again, I think the company that I work for works very hard to serve the public interest. You know, um, we do have stations that do very good work in investigative reporting. I, I remember watching the first person testify before the Senate when on the Toyota problems, and the first person that testified was a consumer who had one of the original problems with sticking accelerators in Toyota vehicles. And she spent five minutes talking about the media outlet that brought this to the forefront, the, per, the, the first media outlet that invested, investigated it was one of our stations, WATE in Knoxville. Uh, we recognize that more can be done, more should be done, um, but as a company that works hard to serve the public interest and to serve our local viewers, what we're looking for in this incredibly changing transitional time coming out of uh, an incredible tran uh, or contraction in the business is a little bit of time and a little bit of freedom to figure out what the right model is going forward and to continue to work to better serve the communities where our television stations are located. Um, well, one, I think that uh, I would like to look at the economic studies as well. I think that there should be antitrust-based um, triggers for um, understanding um, anti-competitive behaviors in the media system. I think there should be um, equal protection access to media sources and airwaves. Um, and, uh, and so that goes to say that I don't think we should be putting all our resources or a big portion of our resources in the biggest players, um, especially since they haven't shown that they're using local content in a useful way. Um, and... Uh, and I'm obviously for net neutrality rules because um, I think that uh, if we can allow content to be created and distributed, then we would be able to figure out the models that um, can actually support uh, public interest media. Thank you very much to, uh, to all of our speakers. As we now turn to the public comment uh, part of the proceedings, we've invited one person to, uh, to speak for two minutes. That's Sita Pina Angatarar a doctoral candidate here in the Department of Communications at Stanford. Oh, not here. Uh, if they're not here, please, Jen, then anyone who'd like to speak, please line up at the microphone. I would ask you uh, in each case to identify yourself by name and affiliation, if any, and uh, to limit your comments to uh, two minutes, please. Hello, my name is Ivar Deal, and I am a concerned citizen. Um, I've been paying attention to FCC policy uh, for an unnaturally long period of time, I would say, considering uh, even into my teenage years. So, um, and it's been mostly going in a deregulatory um, direction, uh, even requiring a court stay. Um, 
on the behalf of the, uh, the, the public. So I would say that, uh, you know, with deregulation in business, I'm a business owner myself now, and, uh, you know, I don't really want a lot of crazy regulation on my, you know, dictating things to me. But if it's in the interest of, public, of the public good, which I think that a um, regulation against media consolidation is definitely, I mean, I, we've heard a lot of commentary today that would argue that it is in the public good, that we need to have a diversity of ownership and voices in the media, and that the Internet is not going to particularly solve that problem. Um, and I would also argue that uh, we've, we've heard the one, I would say it's the eighth dirty word, uh, which is subsidies, was mentioned a few times. I do think it's probably time. Big, me uh, big business is bailing out. You know, um, I don't think that there's going to be some magical conversion, uh, convergence between the uh, ends of uh, business viability and the public interest. Uh, we need to uh, make sure that we have an informed citizenry, and it's a national security issue. Um, uh, <clears throat> also, I would say that uh, also I love newspapers. I read the Oakland Tribune, and I complain about it a lot. Um, but uh, pretty much everyone else I know in my demographic uh, 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 that reads papers reads the New York Times because the writing is better, um, the coverage is more in-depth. But, you know, for local, New York Times just doesn't do it. That's why I read the Tribune. So um, I think that we need to invest in uh, higher quality uh, in the newspapers, as we've already established the newspapers um, don't have the uh, issues that uh, television broadcasting does of have to, having to have interesting video and things like that. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's good for covering journalism and, 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 um, and covering uh, uh, issues, and uh, it's a big content provider. 96% uh, of the content came from um, traditional news sources in the Pew Research Study that was aforementioned. Um, so I guess that concludes. There's many other things. I would say also net neutrality, extremely important. Please don't sell us out on that one. Please don't. Please don't. Please don't. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, my name is Marie Pender, and I'm just uh, here just to express my view. Uh, I know there's an economic... Oh, I, I understand over and over from the big mass corporations that, that mass media that there is an economic s situation that we, and they blamed everything from the recession to the internet as a way of they haven't been able to, they're losing money. But let me ask everybody, have you ever heard in Europe, have you heard of any paper over there going bankrupt? Have you, uh, they actually have the internet. They have a, it's cheap. <laughs> How about that? Also, they have the, some of the fastest uh, broad, broadband in the world. I mean, as far as broadband, uh, the speed, and they also are very uh, economical. In France alone, it's half the price of being able to get on the Internet than we do. So why aren't they over there going bankrupt? You know, we think about who owns the mass media. we got consolidation. Consolidation is that we are hearing the same thing on our news over and over again. How many times have you heard about Michael Jackson? How many times have you heard about Sarah Palin? In the newspaper, in one Sunday, I counted her 18 times. So whose fault is it? Let's ask some real questions. Thank you. Comment on the European situation? Thank you very much. Press, for the most part, have a terrific advantage in that they don't publish in English. And, 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 and the reason for that is that there's a, an abundance of content on the Internet in English. But if you want to read something in Swedish or German, you have far fewer places to go. Further, uh, a number of the newspapers outside the United States, including in Japan as well as Europe, have not put most of their content on the web for free, as American publishers did in a particularly brain-dead moment. So uh, the, the, it, they, the, they have not, they, they have managed to preserve the print business model uh, and, it, and for a period longer than in the U.S. Welcome. Hi, uh, I'm Eve Maitland and uh, I am unaffiliated. I'm just a concerned citizen. And I just wanted to say that uh, I think that there are two things that are really concerning me just attending this hearing. And the first is that there seems to be a real um, deference 
for the idea of monetization of what is essentially a public good. That is the reason that the Federal Communications Commission exists, was to protect the idea of network broadcasting as a way for people to stay informed and be participating citizens in our democracy. And I did not hear any mention of that whatsoever, really, until um, Mr. Hamilton here uh, came on the scene. So thank you very much for bringing that up. And uh, the second thing I wanted to say is that I think there needs to be more attention paid to the quality of the media that's online. I mean, there was a lot, or not online, but in general, there was a lot of talk about distribution mechanisms and almost nothing paid, and the amount of time that local content would be aired, but almost none paid to the quality and the information presented. I find content usually is repetitive. It's very difficult to find um, certain facts online, or anywhere, really. Um, my mother was trying to discover the names of the 11 victims who died on the uh, oil rig a month ago, and that was only available in one spot, and it was the World Socialist Weekly. <laughs> So um, it's really dismaying to see that there really still is a substantial amount of gatekeeping, even though I don't think it's intentional. I think sometimes it is. Uh, watching the Iraq war um, come into being and a reliance on Judith Miller, who was later discovered not to be telling the truth about anything. And it's it's concerning to me that we're so reliant on these sources, which are deemed uh, verified simply because they're paid or have a position of prominence. So the more we can do something about that while balancing that against First Amendment issues, I think the better. So that's tough, but thank you very much. Excuse me, do you have any specific suggestions for us as to what we might do to improve the quality of, of news <laughs> as well as the availability? Uh, I find that there's just a real... Um, as we chase after markets, there is a definite race to the bottom. We're... I mean, we were watching something on the Discovery Channel the other night that was about astrophysics, and you would think that that's already a fairly niche market. But obviously, there was a lot of attention paid to just how dumb we could make this show. It was extremely repetitive. It could have been about, you know, half an hour long. Instead, it was an hour long. And it was really reliant on... Um, very stupid metaphors that did not seem to speak to any of the issues that they were really presenting. And mostly it was um, cool animations. <laughs> and that's a shame. I mean, when we talk about choice available in media, it should be a choice. It shouldn't be, oh, I want to watch the same stupid stuff that's on 20 other channels. So that's my suggestion is have higher standards. We, we really want to know more stuff. Honestly, we do. Uh, we'll, we'll take one question now that we've received over Twitter, but please, please don't go away. We'll get to you next. This dovetails very well with your question. This was a question that was raised on Twitter. If com traditional media is providing more soft news, stuff about celebrities or high-profile crimes in other markets or whatever, aren't they just giving the people what they want? Why should the government care about that? If no one covers the hard news and no one cares, why should the FCC? Any comments? Sure. Uh, in the 1980s, the uh, chairman of the FCC said the public interest is defined by the public's interest. And he also said TV is just a toaster with pictures. Uh, and by that, he meant that there was no difference between information markets and uh, other markets, that there was no market failure. Um, even Michael Powell, on his first day as chairman of the FCC, when he was asked about the digital divide, he said, there's a Mercedes divide. I'd like one, but I can't afford one. Um, I have a different view, and I think a lot of the people in different decades in the FCC had a different view, and that is that um, information has positive spillovers. When you consume information about public affairs, it makes you a better voter, and when you're a better voter, society's better off. But um, when companies tell a story that has a public impact, they can't monetize that, so they don't tell those stories as often. So I'm willing to use the word market failure, and I'm willing to say there's a difference between what people want to know and what they need to know. And that difference in economics is called a positive externality, and it's a market failure. And in one way, it's why the FCC exists. Uh, I'd say I talked earlier about the two types, of two categories of content that we talk about, you know, with our newsrooms all the time, interesting content versus relevant content. And in a perfect world, we would only deal with relevant content. But the reality is uh, 
newscasts need to be a mix of both and predominantly relevant content. I don't think enough newsrooms and enough newscasts deal with a high enough percentage of relevant content, but uh, unfortunately, newscasts, in my opinion, need to be a combination of both. Is that a function of the cost of doing hard news, or is that a function of seeking ratings? Um, <clears throat> it's not necessarily seeking ratings. I think that's a, a, a byproduct of it. You know, I've looked at it before and thought to myself, in, in, you know, as a pure journalist, I should only be doing relevant content. I should only be covering issues in depth. The, the issue with that is, unfortunately, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a harsh reality with people, and it's a harsh reality with society. If you produce just that, you miss a lot of people that need to hear the relevant content, but won't watch unless some of the interesting content is in the mix as well. So, no, it's not, you know, we don't include Michael Jackson in our newscasts purely to bump the ratings. In some cases, it's, you know, you reach a greater audience, you can have a greater impact on the relevant content if you include a mix of the interesting content. And I'll be the first one to say that I do think that a lot of newsrooms put too much of an emphasis on the interesting content and need to put a greater emphasis on the relevant content. I actually think that the people watching crime stories on the news are probably pretty bored um, with the news they're watching. I think maybe they'll get a slight bump or high from hearing something outrageous, but actually, you know, we have a downfall or decline in our education system, and we're not, and, and TV is not helping to supplement um, what's missing in our education system. And I think if we did have more engaging, more um, thought provoking content, and I think the internet is uh, sort of provoking that kind of thought, um, then we'd actually have less bored people and we'd be able to create a cycle of more and more interesting content. So I think it's important to address the market failures. It's something that um, I did mention before that uh, and I think the role of nonprofits in public broadcasting is to um, address the problems that the market doesn't address. And, um, and, and, and that includes low bandwidth problems as well. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. Um, my name is Al Davis. I, I'm in, uh, I, I live in Flint, Michigan. What's that? Okay. Um, all right. My name is Al Davis. I live in uh, Flint, Michigan, and uh, I'm with uh, Flint Community Radio. Uh, we applied in 2007 for a non-commercial radio station and did not get, a, get selected. We lost our bid. There's much talk about media consolidation and commercial media. Well, non-commercial media, non media consolidation is really a bigger problem. There are large non-commercial chains with main studio waivers that often have no localism at all other than the IDs or weather that are inserted by an automation system from far away. While most commercial stations have at least some local staff and programming, the largest of the NCE change ha chains have none at all. They operate as repeaters, not the full service stations that they are licensed to be. They're kind of like commercial broadcasters without any responsibility. Non-commercial broadcasting should be a haven for localism. Volunteer-run community radio, student-run college radio can provide community engagement that no commercial entity can do. Due to competition for a scarcity of channels, local groups such as ours often cannot get any channel at all because there are none available, all taken by these uh, glorified repeaters. In a competitive decision, of who gets a channel when there's one available, often the decision goes to the best proposal done by some hired consultant that has relatively little to do with the uh, merits of the organiza organization applying. And so far, of the 2007 window, roughly two-thirds of the community applications have lost. That is, the like media groups and stuff like that. Anyway, NCE ownership rules should actually be stricter than the commercial rules. Local ownership should be a requirement, and main studio waivers should be harder to get. For non-commercial, one station per owner is actually a reasonable limit. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Lindsay Vurek, and I live in West Marin in Berkeley. Uh, my wife and I, who's passed away, used to own a small chain of stores, and when we sold that, it allowed me to retire in 1999. And I found this to be one of the more compelling issues that I have spent time working on. I've attended three FCC hearings, and in that time, I've seen great consolidation, and I've seen also increasing apathy and um, despair among the population. You can, if you've attended other hearings in past years, you can see how few people there are here compared to in the past, and I personally attribute that to some despair in the population because of the great consolidation. So you can tell from my remark that I'm hoping that you will serve as a check and balance for any further consolidation. And some of the particulars that you might implement to help uh, stave off the consolidation is with the extra digital channels you know, at some fair profit to the holders, for instance, like Cron, that that they're, some of those are freed up and given in some form to the public. Um, or that, or you know, and I don't want to be unfair to those to for them to take a loss on it, but that that might help. And you know, I know that the gentleman from Young Broadcasting, you know, wants time for them to utilize those. But I know that in McChesney, for instance, Professor McChesney's shown that as far as relevant content by the commercial broadcasters, that there's always the limitation because of the fear of offending sponsors. Sponsors are not, you know, afraid of crime reporting and so on. So there is some self-censorship that constantly goes on in commercial broadcasters when they do relevant content, it almost always steps on somebody, some powerful toes or economic toes. So you have to somehow address that so that that, you know, doesn't continue to happen and that there is some, I don't know if it could be through indemnification or making more public channels. And, you know, and you don't want them governed by a necessarily a bureaucratic uh, institution, unless it's very, you know, f fair and diverse. So, you know, there, as far as um, in the shared service agreements that were mentioned, there definitely should, you should look at those and put some rules associated with those. If they do economically help the broadcasters to survive, the, I certainly hope that they can, it, those could exist, but you can see where you could limit content extremely if, as the uh, gentleman from the representing the union, sh you know, showed, he basically uh, showed examples of how content is limited through the shared service agreements. So, if you actually didn't make those such a free form thing, and there were some rules applied to those, and I think that should be within the FCC's uh, domain to be able to do that. So those are some suggestions that I have. Thank you. Hi. My name is Peter Frank. First, as a former president of Pacifica Radio, I would strongly endorse the comments of the gentleman from Michigan. Uh, I'm here as chair of the Committee on Democratic Communications of the National Lawyers Guild. The National Lawyers Guild, as you may know, is a 70-year-old organization of lawyers that tries to put our services at the service of people's rights over economic rights. The Committee on Democratic Communications is committed to the right to communicate as a human right. Our view is that it is a human right under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and legally under the, the uh, Covenant on Civic and Political Rights, which the United States is, is a party to. You're talking about media ownership rules and modification of your rules they should be modified. They should be modified to make media ownership much more diverse. You know, I don't see how anybody after the last few weeks could be talking about less regulation rather than more. We had the economy, the uh, derivatives, we had the mining disaster, we have what's not an oil leak but an oil gusher going on right now that seems unstoppable. All of these is because key industries 
which serve a lot of things, only one of which is shareholder profits, were not properly regulated. So you need to do more regulation. You need to ensure that there's more diversity of ownership, not less. Uh, so as I put it, we've seen the failure of non-regulation. Uh, I would strongly endorse the McChesney idea of a spectrum fee. I don't like the use of the word subsidy. It's not a subsidy. The media networks are getting free rent, free use without rent of an incredibly valuable public asset, which is the airwaves. They should be paying for that. I was just at the uh, PBS annual conference in Austin, uh, sat through a presentation by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting on how you apply for grants there. The hoops that people have to go through for the pittance of money that Congress now gives CPB to dole out to everybody involved with public broadcasting in all of its large and small forms is just a shame. Uh, there needs to be a large grant, a large amount of money, a tiny fraction of the value of the airwaves that these broadcasters use set aside for public media and then let the commercial broadcasters be the commercial broadcasters. But you need to do more, not less. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Paul Coppola. I'm a librarian at San Jose State University. Um, I'm also the liaison to the journalism and mass comm department there. And uh, uh, my question concerns mostly newspapers, uh, with all due respect to all the hardworking uh, broadcast radio and television reporters. Uh, in our city, the San Jose Mercury News has been shrinking at an alarming rate for the last five years. Nevertheless, they still do some extremely important stories, um, uh, like uh, poor representation of uh, low-income defendants in the court system, uh, the controversy over the f possible 49er stadium in Santa Clara, um, uh, police brutality against our Latino community, so on and so forth. So there's been some very, very important stories. And with all due respect to broadcast uh, television news, I simply can't see those stories being covered in the kind of depth and complexity they need to be in a two-minute uh, spot on the news. So now uh, Robert McChesney's name has come up from a couple of other speakers, and I want to ask uh, specifically uh, Dr. Hamilton and Mr. Mutter. Um, McChesney's view is that, is that the... the uh, Congruence of advertising and uh, uh, journalism in paper newspapers through most of the 20th century was sort of a fortuitous coincidence, and he actually believes that it, it, it might not even be profitable, be possible to be profitable anymore uh, doing serious journalism. Um, and I wonder what you thought about that. Uh, Mr. Mutter, you made the remark about um, the non-English newspapers and how they were managing to sustain their, that model for longer, but it almost sounded like if you had gone on, I almost felt like I might have heard you say that you didn't think it would be sustainable forever. What, what do you think about the viability of journalism as a profitable enterprise just in general, conceptually? Good journalism costs a lot of money. Uh, it takes time. The, the more complex stories, the deeper stories, the stories that you can't just roll, up, roll, roll over and take a picture of them or talk about them, uh, take a long time to develop. Uh, historically, the mass media in this country, both newspapers and commercial radio and TV, um, benefited until really the Internet age uh, with uh, something close to monopoly like uh, pricing power in their markets. If you are a store and you needed to buy an ad in the newspaper, there was maybe two newspapers, usually only one. You had to pay whatever the newspaper charged. If you wanted to be on TV, uh, you basically had to pay whatever uh, the local broadcaster charged. So uh, if you look at the history of, of revenues of these kinds of companies in the post-World -war, War II era, you can't say post-war anymore because there's so many wars, in the post-World War II era, uh, you'll see that they moved just, just up in a perfect uh, from lower left to upper right. But that all broke when uh, the Internet came and suddenly the markets were fragmented, as I discussed earlier, and uh, uh, consumers could go find their own information and, and so the, the, the high, rate price, high, high advertising rates uh, that publishers and broadcasters could charge are breaking down, but they're still stuck with the high costs of owning printing presses or TV towers and fleets of trucks in the case of newspapers. So they're, they're, they're coming to the day when that they, have no, they don't have the power to set rates the way they used to, and as the rates come down, as the demand for advertising comes down, as audiences shrink both in print and, and in broadcast, when all those things happen, there's enormous profit pressure, and they go from being very, very good businesses to being not so good businesses to maybe not being businesses at all. 
on the supply side is that you could lower the cost to journalists of discovering stories. And by that I mean right now if I have a stack of 100 documents and if I say that it's about terrorism, the government has funded great software to do name and entity extraction from those documents, uh, DARPA and Homeland Security. And if I say I have 100 uh, videos and they have, and again, they relate to the war on terror, government has funded great work software in Arabic and Chinese to create automatic transcript of those. If I say I have 100 documents in the deal with the city council, the government hasn't funded uh, uh, good software, and that software is a public good. So in my uh, remarks, I talked about how NSF and other government agencies that are funding software in other aspects of government that produce public goods like national defense, that they could also help fund open source software that would help reporters and journalists and citizens to hold government accountable by helping us do essentially public interest data mining. So that would be an optimistic cost-based note. I'm glad that uh, you're a librarian because my example or my answer to what you're saying is that, you know, if public libraries didn't exist now, um, there's no way they would get invented now because the way we think about things is whether or not they are profitable. Um, but uh, I just went to a library in Wyoming and um, they collected a dollar from each person, I think, in all, in all of Wyoming. Um, and they were able to build a, build a $17 million um, library there that was beautiful. Um, and so I think there is a rethinking of what is worth investing in um, and how to promote the public good because it does, uh, now we're finally realizing as a society that it, it um, has lots of positive benefits. Good afternoon. Notwithstanding my earlier admonition, I will uh, identify myself. My name is Richard Knee. That's uh, K-N-E-E, -E, just like elbow. I am a freelance journalist in San Francisco, and um, I was the uh, founding member of the freelance unit of the California Media Workers Guild. We freelancers have a definite stake in this. Not long ago, uh, one client publication that I had was swallowed, sunsetted, into a competing publication. I lost that client. I lost that work. I lost that money. And trying to find alternate work, an alternate client, isn't easy. And I doubt that my own case is unique in that respect. I'd like also to urge the FCC to press Congress and the administration to reinstate the fairness doctrine in order that we get complete coverage. Too often you turn on a controversial issue on a newscast, even on PBS. Oh, we get a Republican, we get a Democrat, boom, that's both sides, our job's done. Our job's done. There are more than two sides to those stories. There are too many minority parties and minority viewpoints. The Green Party, Peace and Freedom Party, American Independent Party, Reform Party, Libertarian Party, their views are not represented on the media. What has consolidation given us? Companies like Clear Channel, which in the true spirit of American democracy forbids its stations from playing certain songs like Imagine by John Lennon. And the issue is about more than money. It's about more than democracy. Sometimes it's about life and death. Remember the disaster that occurred in Minot, Minnesota, or I'm sorry, Minot, North Dakota, when a disaster, in the middle of a disaster, none of the radio stations had even as much as a switchboard operator on premises. All of the radio stations were remotely owned, remotely controlled, and somebody died as a result, and six other people were hospitalized. There is blood on the hands of the Federal Communications Commission. What are you going to do to prevent that from recurring? Good afternoon. My name is Peter Broadwell, and I work at a local technology search company. Not the big ones. Uh, we're getting bigger, though. Uh, I had to take a little time out of work today to come and tell you that, um, 
there's this sort of myth that the, the internet is going to give us vast numbers of sources and everyone can find whatever they want out there. Looking at it from our side, where we actually go out and try and crawl all these sources, one of our biggest problems is removing the duplicates. Uh, as somebody earlier mentioned, oftentimes there's only one source and it's way off in the weeds somewhere. And uh, I just want, uh, you know, from a, from a really on the ground perspective in the middle of the technology here in Silicon Valley, there's, it's a real different view of what's going on than than you might have listening to uh, big media say that they're going to get swallowed up by all these sources. For the most part, it's all the same stuff everywhere, no matter where you look. Thank you. Hello, Michael McCaskill again. Uh, I really made my point earlier about worrying about all uh, the consolidation and how there's fewer, fewer voices. And Mr. Greif said something I'd like to, to ask or follow up on. I would, you know, I was like, wow, the vice president for news and this, the general manager. And then you said that you didn't know what your broad or your uh, the uh, digital shoulder uh, policy was going to be because uh, that was above your pay scale. And I was curious, how many people are above your pay scale? And on a related, especially when we're cutting reporters, and on a related question, how much debt does your your company, Young Broadcasting? Uh, how indebted is it, and how, how much are your interest payments for the 10 stations that you've purchased? Well, for, first you. of all, there are lots of people above my pay scale. And the comment that I made about the philosophy and the strategy involving the digital spectrum, um, my primary duty is news strategy on the existing broadcast television stations. So unfortunately, I'm not intimately involved in what the plans are for deployment of any strategy on the digital spectrum at this point. I was, I was selected by the company to talk about the impact on local news and our local newscasts of new media. So <clears throat> I wish I had more information about, um, you know, what the plans are for rollout and how to use the digital spectrum. I know a little bit about it. Um, you know, I, it's just not something that I'm tasked to do with the company at this point. My, job's, my job and my duties are a little bit different. What was, the, what was the other question? How much interest is going towards, you know, the, the purchase of these stations? And my general point being, I, it's not that, you know, you should know everything, but in this time when we're cutting reporters and cutting newsrooms, why are there a whole lot of people above the news, you know, the vice president of news and the general manager's pay scale back at Corporate Central? And couldn't that money be better applied towards the communities and the news? Um, <clears throat> um, I, I don't quite know how to answer that. Apply, I guess apply my salary to more reporter positions. Is that... Um, the general point I'm making, when we're consolidating, sure. we're cutting at the bottom, yet there's a lot of people above your pay scale. You'll understand and if I, I you, don't I volunteer to do that at this point, though, right? I'm, that's well, I think that's maybe something the FCC needs to look at and see that the economic motivations are being no, applied you know, to the wrong side. It, it, is a, it, is a complex, it is a complex business. I mean, it, it really is. And the idea that in our company, the reason for having a vice president of news, uh, somebody that can help all of the stations work together to do the best possible job they can in, in developing content that has greater impact in their individual communities. You know, um, I'll mention some of the, you know, some of the, uh, the things that I mentioned early on in my speech. I mean, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, for example, when we had the flooding locally, uh, the staff was in when the rain started and they had been on the air for two straight days. And if you work in a newsroom, you know how consuming that is. And it's nice to have somebody that sits at a, a level where you can look at the total product and look at what's happening and walk in and say, we need to do a telethon. We need to stay on the air. Let me bring some people in from the other stations to help out so we can continue to provide information that's important to the stations. So would I like to have more uh, reporters at all the television stations? Absolutely. Um, could the company take my job and, and eliminate my job and use my salary to hire more reporters? Absolutely. Uh, am I overpaid? I, I would suppose if you asked a lot of people in the newsrooms, they'd probably say that I was. 
I, I hope that the position that I have in the company, and not all companies have vice presidents of news, the, the reason behind having a vice president of news position is to make the individual newsrooms uh, more productive, uh, to make sure that they're thinking about the bigger issues, like relevant versus interesting content. And in a case like we had in Nashville recently, to make sure that there are additional resources that are applied to that situation so we can better serve the public interest. Good afternoon. My name is Sue Wilson. I am a 23-year-old veteran of broadcasting turned media activist, and I have a couple of thoughts I want to share with you today. Number one, I live in a rural area. I get 28K dial-up. That's the best I'm getting. I used to get television stations, but then the digital transition went, and, and now I don't get any TV at all. One of these days, that errant satellite's going to take out my satellite TV, and you know what I'm going to have left? I'm going to have AM radio. That's all I'm going to get. And in my market, that means my major source of news and information is going to be Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> now, what can you do about this? You're not going to reinstate the Fairness Doctrine. We know that. And you cannot rewrite the 1996 Telecommunications Act. But what I believe you can do, and Mr. Lake and Mr. Friedman, I'm so happy because you are here with the Media Bureau. You can start enforcing these license challenges that are coming through. I want to talk for a moment about the intercom stations in Sacramento. Sacramento's KDND sponsored a water drinking contest that killed a woman named Jennifer Strange. The station was found liable for her death. But in doing the research on it, I found that intercom, in its 2008 shareholders report, is saying that all six of its stations in Sacramento have license challenges pending. But they're telling their shareholders that based on past performance by the FCC, they have high confidence that none of their licenses will be taken away. We are looking at a case where a woman died, where a very diverse jury found the station civilly liable for her death. Now there are station license challenges in front of you. The last time I checked with the Media Bureau, you couldn't remember the last time you took a station's license away. I'm here to ask you to please pay attention to the death of Jennifer Strange, to KDND, to Entercom, and realize that we the people have our eyes on you. Uh, my name is Aki Tanaka, and I'm a retired uh, concerned citizen. I just wanted to read a quote from Rupert Murdoch. It says, this merger continues the strengthening of our various marketing opportunities to the benefit of advertisers who use all types of vehicles to get their message across to consumers, whether it be through television, print, or other marketing operations. Now, this is something that happens when you have no integration because you want a society of consumers in a corporate state, whereas in a republic, you want to inform citizens that can, you know, uh, make informed decisions about their with, with, as a citizen. So we dropped the ball on uh, corporate media because corporate media is all commercials and that's all we get. So I hope that at least in the internet that we still have some freedom so we could be citizens in our republic. So that's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Kate Bernier, and I live in Berkeley. Uh, you may think what I'm about to say is not related, but you'll find out at the end that it is. I am here today to pay tribute to a great scientist and researcher, Robert A. Halliwell, Stanford Radiological Institute engineer emeritus, seemingly virtually unknown in, in his own alma mater. Back in the 60s, Halliwell and Park found that radiation from electrical power transmission lines, hence the electric grid, it's, this is known as PLHR, disturbs the magnetosphere uh, which protects us from the sun. 
which leads to another inconvenient truth. Man-made, hence your, all your wireless paraphernalia, man-made EMR, EMFs, electromagnetic radiation and electromagnetic fields affect global warming through increased electron precipitation, increased lightning discharges, and increased nitrogen oxide, which are greenhouse gases levels in the atmosphere and through changes in the structure of the magnetosphere, which protects us from the sun. Another Stanford researcher, uh, what, Fraser Smith, what, emeritus now, he was able to measure these changes in the magnetosphere in the trees. Here back on the earth, these changes are reflected back to the earth in the trees. And so I am here to encourage you to wherever possible to use fiber optics. People like me have spent the last 10 years of my life fighting people like you who don't pay any attention to the health or environmental effects of radiation because of your stupid Section 704 of the Telecommunications Act. So I, I urge you, please, to consider the poor earth and people. Thank you. Hello, my name is Oriana Saportas, and I'm a Oakland resident and a public access uh, producer. And uh, really, for me, the bottom line is um, we need the FCC's help because uh, we know that uh, the mainstream media media is owned pretty much by corporations. And the reason is because these corporations really have the money to send lobbies, lobbyists all, all the time to Washington, D.C. to buy um, politicians to... Um, that would benefit the corporation's interests who own the media. So, uh, and the, you know, it's too bad, but we, like the citizens, don't have that power to go and, and the money to go all the time to Washington, D.C. to lobby. So we really depend on you, the FCC, to, to speak up for us. And, I mean, we'll do our best to do that, too, but, but we need your help. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Tracy Rosenberg, and I'm speaking one more time. Hello again. Um, a reference was made earlier this afternoon somewhere in the conversation on the panel to the story of the Genesis 6 and how that bubbled up from um, the community into the legacy media. And bubble up is such a merry-sounding term that I just wanted to kind of attach it to the reality of the hard work that people who really felt deeply impacted about that story and that it had to be told did for months to make that story bubble up. They didn't sleep. They gave up all their spare time. They lost wages. They lost jobs. Um, if we're relying on that sort of monumental effort to resolve the failures of the legacy media and of, frankly, media consolidation, that's a pretty risky placard to um, hang ourselves on. It's a tremendous cost to the communities whose stories aren't being covered. And you know what? For every time that it does happen, there are 20 times that it doesn't happen. So bubbling up is great, but bubbling up is not a strategy to um, defend the public interest. We talked a bit, and I want to thank Mr. Mutter for bringing up sort of the uh, digital sideband channels in both radio and television and um, the waste of that space. We also could bring up some of the somewhat incredibly repetitive cable stations that I think most people would agree are somewhat wasteful. And then there's also the waste of um, things like seven Christian radio stations in Stockton when possibly two or three would be sufficient. Why is there nothing on these outlets, these million-dollar outlets, rather than being populated with independent media, which is everywhere? I think the answer to that question is clear, and it was brought up at this panel. It's gatekeeping. 
I heard Mr. Grief say something about some of the reasons why it was not possible to maximize these million dollar broadcasting assets that you guys are responsible for making sure are being used in the public interest. And he mentioned the difficulties of fact checking and the difficulties of training. And these things are all true. When we're talking about millions of dollars in public assets, surely there is some way to spend just a little bit of time and effort checking the facts and helping to train people how to produce this content. We are talking, again, about million dollars of public assets. Fact checking and training cannot be described as mortal flaws that prevent us from using them. Something is always better than nothing. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Shaw, and I uh, live in Davis and Berkeley. And uh, I work for a nonprofit called Common Frequency, and I also work with a nonprofit called Davis Media Access. And we are a public access, educational access, and low power radio station. And uh, first off, I just wanted to commend the commission for a larger representation of women and uh, people of color on this two panels this afternoon than people actually own radio and television uh, licenses in, uh, around the country. So good job, uh, I'll commission that. Secondly, I'd like to say uh, it struck me, particularly over watching all of this today, that uh, the, the term relevant and interesting keeps coming up. Seems to, and well, wait, I want to back up one second here. I, I noticed on this panel that the uh, FCC staffers were very much more lively, and I want to. Uh, I thought that was very interesting. There's a lot more ideas, and a lot more ideas that I, uh, that I, uh, uh, that I, uh, the, I, I agree with on this panel. And so I thought that was very interesting that the staff uh, actually uh, responded to that and are asking a lot more questions. But uh, the relevant, interesting uh, point that, was, that Brian brought up, as far as the newsrooms, I work at. I've worked at a public access TV station, low power radio station, educational access. It's a community media center, and we've got more relevant content than I know what to do with. And uh, I would just like to offer that up if Cron wants to run any of, it, any of it, and I'm sure I could help find other uh, relevant content in the, in the San Francisco area. But my point is this, is, and my, my plea to the FCC is this, and that is that uh, whenever you, there are community media centers exist across the country, please try to find ways to help them flourish, and because that is where true citizen journalism is going on and that is where relevant content is going on. The interesting content maybe people find on YouTube these days and it's wacky and it's crazy or whatever, but some of the relevant content is really happening at the ground level and it's happening at these community media centers, public access TV, low power radio stations, community, uh, community radio stations, and in any, uh, any policy decisions that you make, please try to encourage those uh, community media centers to uh, thrive and before it's too late. Before they are before they're gone. So thank you. Hello. Um, so I'm a tiny um, Lisa Gray Garcia from Poor Magazine, Prensa Pobre, Poor News Network. Um, first of all, I always. Uh, identify as a daughter of a poor woman of color and although I look like my colonizer dad I um, my mother lived inside of uh, brown skin for her whole life and dealt with racism and poverty in this country I say that because we started Poor Magazine out of our experience, experience of poor people being silenced actively. So I represent and I stand in solidarity with uh, communities of color and poor people who are constantly and actively silenced, uh, excluded, and taken out of the spaces of uh, power and media and academia. That said, Poor Magazine is a community learning center, a community media center. We produce our own research. We have a project called We Search, that's W-E, Search, and we're doing profiles of folks who are migrante scholars who are being racist, uh, racist, uh, uh, impacted by these SB 1070 and other forms of racist legislations that are constantly impacting us. Uh, folks who are on welfare, who are having our benefits taken away every day. Um, if we were unable to have collective access to the Internet because there was levies and charges that would make it impossible for our voices to be heard, it is already hard enough for the voices of people in poverty, youth, adults, and elders to actually access spaces of power to ever be heard. 
So I urge you, panel, listen to the people who have talked today. Listen to us. We're all here. All of our scholars are here. That's poverty scholars, people who have struggled through positions of struggle their entire life. Keep these, these lines of communication really, truly accessible. Because if they're not, our laws and legislations like SB 1070, like the cuts that the governor is proposing for all of welfare, which would make California the only state not having welfare, and other forms of oppression will get worse until we'll have a true form of what we at Poor Magazine call digital apartheid. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Riate Akil McLaughlin. I'm Ram at Poor Magazine, staff writer, published poet, um, digital resistor, and I run Family Project, our on-site child care. I also have two daughters, one who spends most of her time in, in Mexico, who, who's back and forth. She's from Mexico, from Chiapas, Mexico. And how am I, sp if I don't have access to the internet, if you're, if you're overcharging me, I'm a poor uh, father of color, in in United States, I I can I can barely afford to pay rent. I can barely afford to put food on on my table, even though I still do. How am I supposed to access my daughter when she's when she's how much how can I write her on the internet if if you're charging me for it? How am I supposed to let my let my youngest daughter Kaya uh, watch Dora or you know um, this these charges? Um, like 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 the lady said before me said it's about access, and you're denying access for us to to access each other, whether poor, rich, or not. And I, you're this is getting way out of out of line. So please, please understand that community communication are are two in the same thing. Community and communication. Thank you for your time. Hello, uh, my name's Karina Lomeli, and I live in San Francisco. Um, I've been working with Poor Magazine for the past year and a half, and we run a thing called People School. That's Escuela de la Gente. It's a bilingual um, education that will help people um, without papers and without access to this kind of institution like Stanford or any kind of school. Um, they come here and learn uh, creative writing skills, uh, access to media, research, and that's um, their own, from their own land, where they come from, because of globalization. They don't have money to um, come to school such as this, so they come to us, and without um, proper internet connections or access to news and um, information internationally. It will be very hard to run a school that will be meant for um, reaching all parts of the world. Um, this will definitely just take away a lot of our rights as, as knowing, um, keeping up to date with what's going on globally as far as locally. Um, if you press these charges and raise the the amount of uh, cash people have to spend on internet or communication, um, any kind of search that you have to do every day, uh, from like checking your online statements to uh, checking uh, your latest video from YouTube from your mom back in Japan. It's just it's going to create a huge gap, and this is going to create a lot of frustration, and it's also going to create a bigger gap in um, our class uh, society as it keeps growing bigger and bigger. And this is going to just create a, a bigger problem for everyone. Um, I don't know why it's so important to make something private. Um, in the ends of just making more money, you're actually going to be making situation worse across California. Um, t taking these rights, uh, the right of information from people, just because they can't afford it is wrong. And you should really consider just keeping the lines as, as cheap as possible for a better educated community, which we should be um, trying to do every day. And uh, that's, I mean, <laughs> let's not cut the communication branches. It's, it's very vital. 
in these times where there are so many things that are complicated and confusing in, in our globe. There's events every day, anything from an earthquake across the continent to a war that's going on and destroying millions of families. We need to know what's going on. And if you, you raise the, the amount to pay, it's just going to create a bigger gap of not knowing and being misinformed and it's going to cause chaos. Um, and this is not what we need right now. We need to come together and make it easier for these people to access this information and any other information that's given out. Let's not become, uh, let's not be selfish. Let's share what we have. Thank you. I'm Joseph Bolden, and I've been with Poor Magazine since its inception. And... Um, I'm going to get right to it. Uh, uh, I'm a columnist and sometimes uh, on radio. Um, net, ne net neutrality means simply that all like Internet content must be treated alike and move at the same speed over the network. And this is a uh, point of view is expressed by David S. Eisenberg in his well-known paper, rise of the stupid network. Um, under this principle, a neutral rent network is a dumb network, merely passing packets, regardless of the applications they support. Excuse me. Okay. In a stupid network, the data on it would be boss. End users' devices would be free to behave flexibly because in the stupid network, the data is boss. Bits are essentially free, and there is no assumption that the data is of a single data rate or data type. David S. Eisenberg, The Rise of the Stupid Network. In this instance, stupid is smart, and that's what we need. Not a smarter network, a dumber one, so everyone can participate equally. Done. Hello, my name is Bruce Allison. I'm a reporter for Poor Magazine for the last three years. I've been covering stuff. I'm on a fixed income of living in San Francisco of $850 a month, $200 to live on. If you raise my uh, Internet fee, I cannot cover the bills that's going on in the Senate to privatize Social Security and you, you are leaving a vacuum there for elders and young uh, people to what's going on in Sacramento. Please do not raise the fees or bundle packages. This will be a hardship on the poor and also a way that the poor will eventually hurt and violence to the community. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joyce Umamoto, and I'm a Poor News Network correspondent, as well as a poet with Poor Poets Project, of Poor Magazine, Pobre Prensa. I'm here to ask you all, why are we having this hearing again? Net neutrality, I thought, should have been settled. And every day we see our public commons, public services cut, penny by penny, inch by inch. I have been unemployed for the past year because I'm a transcriber. I stabbed my left hand during cooking. The knife went all the way through my fingers, and my left hand has been unusable for a year now. I'm, I don't have any other source of income. My partner ha is a um, private um, architectural consultant. He has had no work since last October. We are on the verge of homelessness. Our, our savings has been 
taken away from us during the latest Wall Street crash because I was conned into putting my pension into a private into this private stock market. I mean, you people, the only thing you think is free should be a free market. What kind of society are we creating when we let people like myself and my partner who can't function in a corporate um, bottom line value system? We need to value soft people. We can't just let them fall through the cracks. We should be having a hearing not on privatization, but on freeing the airways, freeing the TV. You know, this is, this is for us. This is for the people. It's not to make money. Thank you. Hello. Um, I, there was a few points that I didn't uh, get to make, and since it seems like there is some time, I appreciate your um, receptivity to community input. Um, I wanted to say that um, there's a couple of done deals, quote unquote, that are around right now, such as the uh, NBC uh, Comcast merger. Um, I strongly urge you to not, uh, you know, um, give up on that one. As far as let's 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 not let that happen. For one thing, NBC would is. Currently, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, owned by GE, which is the like one of the preeminent nuclear weapons and nuclear power <laughs> manufacturers. I mean, what would our founding fathers, Jefferson and Madison, what would, what would they say if you told them that one of the biggest weapons manufacturers was owning one of the biggest media outlets and was going to be selling it to one of the biggest, essentially kind of like um, Edison, you know, telecommunications carriers. I mean, that just doesn't sound right. That's an unholy trinity if I've ever heard one. I mean, that is sick. And to use, pardon my French, how the hell did we get there? I mean, <laughs> so let's, the pendulum has gone very far in one direction. And I think it is time that we start to you know, go back the other way. I mean, it's not just about like not getting worse. We're already way too close to the edge as far as seriously compromising the democracy in this country. Okay? We need to start reforming. Okay? And another thing is, is with the low-power FM uh, broadcasting, that's a great thing, and I'm glad that that's finally occurred. But are we throwing a bone to the um, communities and as we're about to uh, totally digitize um, radio broadcasting? There hasn't been a lot of transparency, and there hasn't been a lot of um, information for the public about how exactly this transition to digital radio is going to happen. I w really ask that we not bungle this as badly as the TV thing. And I also think that for public safety, we need to have analog um, signals that can be got on a wireless radio, a, a bat you know, battery-powered radio, so that we um, have access to uh, emergency broadcasting. You know, that doesn't require a plug-in digital box. I know it sounds like a boring little detail, but you know, this is a, could be a real lifesaver. We've got to make sure that uh, there's a way in a power outage national or local emergency situation that people can get radio by just, you know, a couple AA batteries, boom, you know, they're keyed in, you know. Okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. I, I would mention that there are now uh, battery-powered portable digital radios available. I think there's one at Best Buy for $35 or something. So that, uh, we agree that that's very important that people have the ability to receive digital radio uh, on a portable basis, and it is it is coming. I can't reach it, really. I mean, I, well, okay. Um, I wanted to thank you for coming and um, giving us this venue to express our opinions. I think this is hugely important. And I have, I said this at the last hearing when you guys were here, I'll just say it again. I feel that net neutrality is absolutely central. It is part of the lifeblood of Silicon Valley and our culture of innovation. I think it's a competitive advantage for us as a nation. I think you'll be making a huge mistake, a huge mistake, if you go down this path of privatization and you limit access because we don't know where the next 
game-changing, brilliant idea is coming from. We also don't know what the audience for that game-changing, brilliant idea might be. And if you limit access by charging, it may not find its, uh, its audience. And that idea may never manifest. And I also want to associate myself with uh, my uh, predecessor's comments. I completely agree with everything he has to say. We need to, we need to have more channels of information Again, it has to do with the culture of ideas. We don't know where the next idea is coming from, and ideas need to be cross-pollinated. They need to, kindred spirits need to find each other and have discussions. And if you limit access by charging a lot of money for it, I think we'll really hamper ourselves, not just in, in small ways, but in large ways. And I strongly encourage you to preserve and extend the accessibility that's at question. Thank you. Michael Cousins again. I spoke this morning, and I wanted to say something about entry to full-service television broadcasting, but I decided, listening to the last six or seven speakers, that that's really not necessary. For the FCC staff, I've met with you. I know how to locate you. We can meet again. We can have that discussion another time. But uh, what I'd like to say about those last few speakers is that I hope you won't think that any of them was off topic. All of those statements were directly on topic. And I hope that, uh, you know, when you come out in the field, sometimes you get an earful. People have very different perspectives, and they're reacting to what they see uh, up front and they're reacting to their own experience, but that's the value of it. So I hope that we can have more of this, that you can broaden the agenda or have specific agendas, but thank you for coming. I think it's a good dialogue and I hope that you can take back uh, a diversity of points from these meetings. Thanks. That all of that input was very welcome. We do have an open proceeding on net neutrality, as I'm sure you know, and. Uh, and we're, we're here exactly to hear the kinds of comments we've been hearing today. Thank you. Good afternoon, or almost good evening. My name is Sita Pena Gangadaran. I'm a PhD student here in the Department of Communication at Stanford University. I actually wanted to um, pose a few questions because I'm kind of like that student that comes in at the end of the lecture and hasn't really paid attention to the conversation that's been going on. Unfortunately, I've been busy with other things. Um, but my three questions um, have to do with um, just the nature of the discussion that's been going on. First of all, I'm just curious, what's the difference between a workshop and a hearing? Because it does seem like, though... Uh, this was billed as a as a workshop. Um, it does seem like people have been interacting as if it's a hearing um, rather than what I think might be beneficial in a workshop, which is dialogue. Um, second of all, um, I'm wondering what evidence the uh, Media Bureau has been collecting about users, viewers, community members, um, and and their experiences with legacy and, and new media. That is, what, what evidence are you collecting? Are you, are you also willing to make that um, available, for example, um, on your new reboot, the FCC website, where we can actually um, try to understand better what it is that you're using as a standard of evidence in, in looking at the tr transition between... Um, new media practices, old media practices, and so forth. Um, I think I'll end it and just have those two questions, um, but I, I would love to hear, I'm sure I can think of, a, of additional questions, but I would love to hear exactly um, what, what the FCC has in mind um, at the conclusion of these workshops and, and, and the extent to which uh, the public will have the opportunity to sort of continue to contribute and add or answer to or respond to some of the issues that are being brought up in these discussions. I anticipated that I might get the question of what's the difference between a hearing and a workshop, and I think the answer is there's no 
uh, fine line between the two. We, I think we call this a workshop in order to stress the first part of that, the work part. We're, we're very much at a working phase now of trying to collect information, and we thought of this as a working section to, uh, to try to get additional information that will help us in formulating uh, our, our way forward. Um, and as your second question, we expect quite soon to be able to release a notice that will formally begin the proceeding and invite comments from everyone in the public on what we should do about our ownership rules. And as part of our study, we will be commissioning uh, studies mostly by academics of, I know we have at least one person who's looking forward to reading them, um, uh, of many of the issues that we've been discussing today, but to try to get real hard data on, uh, on the economic and factual issues that will enter into our final decision here. When we do get those studies, they'll be published, and uh, we'll invite comment on them. Can I respond to that very quickly? Um, sure. One of the things that um, seems to be consistent, certainly in this panel, um, but in, I think, some of the previous workshops, and that, that is that there does seem to be a dearth of uh, more qualitative studies in terms of how people are experiencing this new sort of schizoid media environment. And, and I would strongly urge the commission, the Media Bureau specifically, to, to consider um, looking into qualitative studies. I mean, we've heard from a number of people who tell their stories and their experiences with media today, and I'm sure you've heard it at the other workshops. Um, it does seem like that there is, there's a, a real benefit from actually trying to systematically collect those stories and understand how people are experiencing change in the media environment today. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, go ahead. I was just going to say there is a parallel proceeding that a number of people have mentioned today on the future of media, which looks at the availability of news and information in communities, given the seismic changes in the media marketplace, uh, as well as the current ongoing uh, economic downturn. And that's FCC docket 10-25. Uh, we received comments on May 7th that dealt in part with the question of, of usage of both the new and the traditional media, and I would urge you to look on our website, which is FCC.gov, and you can scroll down and get copies of everything that was filed in the proceeding. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm less interested in um, collecting that information, information myself than seeing that information sort of amalgamated in a meaningful way that sort of points to what the flashpoints are in this discussion. And furthermore, I think that it would be um, helpful to to sort of make clear how the debate on the future of media actually intersects with this media ownership debate. Because yes, there are, are absolutely points of connection, but um, apart from people mentioning it, I think that there needs to be a broader effort to make that that actually clear. Well, just to give you some guidance as to what the scope is of the future of media inquiry, there was a public notice that was issued in January that listed over 40 questions of exactly the type of information that we're going to be considered, going to be considering in that proceeding. So I think that will give you an overview of what we're looking at, and a report will be coming out synthesizing the record in that proceeding. And we will coordinate, of course, very closely between our ownership review and the future of media proceeding. 10-25, general docket 10-25. Hi, Welcome. My, my name is David Harris. I uh, have worked as a computer programmer in networking and led a volunteer effort years ago to uh, connect big mainframes to little uh, microcomputers. The issue, as, as apparently you're very aware, is uh, how people get information. And uh, th the uh, remarks of uh, Alan Mutter seem particularly knowledgeable uh, in, in terms of the technological alternatives that are there. The issue I'd like to, to, to address, and I apologize if somebody's done it, said it before, is that of effective uh, communication. The difference between a, having a radio station that has a captive audience in the so-called drive time and uh, having a uh, access that happens in the middle of the night when everybody's asleep. Uh, perhaps this, uh, some sort of monitoring of the uh, listenership and readership, uh, some, some attempt to um, uh, ev evaluate the uh, 
uh, effect of media ownership. It's the issue of uh, barrels of oil, bar barrels of ink versus uh, single pens uh, that some communication media are more effective than others. And um, we need the diversity in fact as, as well as on paper. Thank you. Um, this is actually very fortuitous that we had planned to adjourn at 5, and uh, we seem to have heard from everyone who wants to speak. I'll ask our panelists. It's been a long day, but if any of you have a, any parting comments you'd like to make, they're welcome. Then I, then I will uh, I'll thank our panelists for very stimulating presentations. And uh, those of you uh, in, in the room, thank you very much for coming, and thank you for all the input. We found it very thought-provoking, and this is exactly why we get out of Washington, to, to get out of the bubble and, uh, and hear what, uh, how our media policies are affecting people in the real world. So we appreciate your being here. Thank you.